Uh, welcome to the Milford School Committee meeting of April 4th. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, the media is present. Anyone wishing to make an audio or video recording, please contact uh, the superintendent of schools or a member of this committee. Um, so the first item on, on our agenda is, it's a terrific item. It's something that we have a lot of fun with every single year. Um, the, the Milford Area Special Olympians, uh, they honor us with our presence once a year, and it's one of the best years that we have, uh, one of the best days of the year and one of the best meetings. Um, that, that we do have. And so uh, what I'd like to do is invite the Special Olympians uh, in to come and speak with us. And I'd also like to invite uh, the coordinator of the Milford Area Special Olympics, uh, Jen Walsh, uh, to come in and speak with us. Jen, do you need more time? Okay. Okay. The referee's not on watch. Sabotage. Can you say what network it is? Yes. We do. Oh, good. Well, we have plenty of time. Well, first, I'd like to thank all of our special Olympians for coming in to speak with us tonight. It's always such a pleasure whenever you guys come in to, to, to see us, and it's our honor to have you here to, uh, 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 this evening. And so I'd like to invite uh, Jen Walsh to come up uh, and, and say a few words. Uh, she's the coordinator for the Milford Area uh, Special Olympics, and she's also a vocational teacher uh, in the public schools. We have a few representatives from each team here tonight. We had five teams um, in the Special Olympics state games this year, um, and, the, and they all did really well. They all, they all represented Milford very well. Um, and it was, it's a very busy weekend. They go to Mil uh, Worcester for the weekend, and they compete all weekend and stay over at night in hotels. And yeah. So they work really hard. They train from October to March, and then they compete. That's terrific. So. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and we have great coaches that work with them, that's why. <laughs> right, Mark? Did you want to introduce the coaches? Or? Sure. Do you have a list? Oh, so I don't forget anybody? I do. Okay. Absolutely. So for the um, Milford Juniors team, I don't see the coaches couldn't make it tonight. Um, there are students here also, um, Nicole Ticino and Cara Di Gregorio, and they have um, other commitments with school, so they couldn't make it. And the students from that team, Zach Landry, Zach, stand up. <laughs> Good job, buddy. <laughs> and Patrick LeBlanc. Yes, buddy. Patrick back there. Oh, my there he is. This is Patrick. <laughs> and Claire Principe. In case you didn't hear her already, Claire is in the house. <laughs> Good job, Claire. <laughs> Good job, Claire. Hi, Claire. Nice job, honey. Hi. Hi, Claire. I'm Patrick. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi, Claire. Good job. Hi, Claire. Hi. She's coming around. You're all going to. Hi. 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 Hi.
<laughs> oh, she knows him already. <laughs> you want a cookie? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mom. No, I know. It, there isn't any. <clears throat> nice job, Claire. You did a great job, honey. <laughs> And from the um, so that this team was ages eight to fifteen, and then our next team, which is twenty-one and over, was the Milford Dribblers and Coach Sandy and Delicato. There she is right there in the green. Uh, Katie Ennis. Hey, Katie. Thanks for coming in, Katie. Bethany Dawes. Yeah. She comes. Good job, Bethany. You can come this way. It's all right. Good girl. Nice job. Nice job. Hi, Bethany. Thanks for coming in tonight. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. Thank you. And Amanda Jean and Delicato. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for coming in. That's everybody from your team, right, Sandy? Yeah, I didn't see it. And we have the Milford Gamers coached by David Haddad and Gina Richards. Back in the corner, hiding. Um, Ashley Aldridge. Good job, girl. Thank you, Ashley. And I think, is that it? Oh, Brett, where is, oh, there he is. Brett Crosby. <laughs> Brett, I almost got fired for that, huh? Thanks for coming in, Brett. <laughs> and um, Brett is representing the state of Massachusetts for a Special Olympics at a national conference. Oh, fantastic. Yep. All right. And Blessed Hinton. Come on up, Blessed. Come on up. We were just doing your team. Good job. Yeah, just in time. We were just doing Thanks. your team. Thanks for coming in. Nice job, buddy. Thanks, man. Proud of you. All right. So that's everybody on your team, okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. So then we have <laughs> the Milford Hoopsters, coached by Chris Forget, who has... Um, recently engaged in his meeting with a wedding planner tonight, so he couldn't make it. Uh, Bo Barrows. Yay. Nice job, Bo. Thanks for coming in, Bo. Billy Travis. Yeah. Good job, Bo. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, um, Earl Wilson. Thank you, Earl. Thank you. Nice job. Okay, and no one snuck in on that team on me, did they? No? Nope. Okay. And Milford Masters, coached by Joe Zenas and John Consoletti. There they are. So from that team, we have Justin Caswell. Nice job, buddy. Good Justin. Nice job, buddy. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's running for mayor later. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Consoletti. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for coming in. Nice job, Jamie. Good job. Nice job. <laughs> John Heron. Watch the wires, John. There you go. Good job, buddy. Nice to meet you, John. Nice job, Thank buddy. Thank you for coming in. Nice job, John. Nice job, 
Amy Hilton. Nice job, girl. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Vasconcelos. Good job, Joe. Nice maneuvering. Nice job, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Joe. See you again. See you tomorrow. <laughs> 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 and That's last but not least, Mark Zenas. Good job watching that, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, uh, You guys all work and play so very hard that you make us all proud. So thank you for coming in and seeing us tonight. We really do appreciate it, okay? And thank you to your coaches. Thank you. That's one of those we've ever had. Bye, Joe. See you tomorrow. All right, well, drive slow. Don't drive fast. Take your time. Keep it low. The last time we had it, I think I just come to the No, really. There you go. Oh, oh, where? <laughs> Trying to shut the meeting down. Probably tried to shut the every light off when they leave the room or something. Better than my school. <laughs> yeah, right. So the next item on our agenda is our approval of minutes. Uh, we have minutes from uh, March 21st, 2013. They are both the regular uh, and the executive sessions of the school committee. Um, did everybody have an opportunity to review those minutes? Okay. Uh, and there were no corrections. Okay, so a motion from Scott, second from Mike, to approve the regular and executive sessions of the school committee meeting of March 21st. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, unanimous in favor, and the motion carries. Uh, the next item on our agenda uh, is announcements, correspondence, and distributions. Does any member bring any announcements, correspondence, or distributions? Rob? Chairman, I'd like to um, congratulate Coach Heather Johnson and the uh, cheerleading team up at the high school uh, for going down to Orlando and, and, and taking home a national championship and, from what I understand, did a great job representing um, themselves, uh, Milford, schools and in the community in general so and a big thanks to their parents you know for being a big part in, in helping get them down there and supporting them yeah, so it's a big, well it's a big commitment it's a lot of time yeah, absolutely it's a lot big of hard trip. work yeah. so it's great on that, I, I don't know if anybody had a chance but I, mean, uh, <coughs> I think it's on the Milford Patch is a video of their final you know, uh, like you know uh, competition it was amazing so if you get a chance to watch it you should really check absolutely. it out it's, it's, uh, that's great. The, 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 I mean, they, they didn't. There wasn't a single flaw in the whole routine. It was amazing. That's great. Um, just wanted to uh, say thank you. I know that, uh, um, that we all have received uh, autism awareness uh, ribbons. Wanted to thank Jen Walsh. It was Jen Walsh that uh, and her team that you know assembled and, and certainly gave, donated these to the to the school committee. Uh, with April being Autism Awareness Month, uh, something something that. Uh, uh, 
certainly hits very close to home. I have several, fam uh, uh, a few family members as well as several friends that um, have been affected by autism. So, you know, certainly thanks to Jen for, mm -hmm. for her and her group. And I see we've got some t-shirts here as well. And, and thank you guys for yeah, wearing blue. I know it's been a, uh, certainly an initiative in many schools throughout the week as well uh, with supporting with autism. So, you know, thank you. So autism awareness month in the back. Or you are small. Look for public schools. <laughs> <laughs> I wear it with pride. Any other members? Standing? Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, send a congratulations out to the National Honor Society. Uh, as you know, we were all there that night. It's quite a it's quite a group of kids. They do a great job. They watch these, you know, the seniors getting their pins and the juniors getting inducted in, and just a great great group of people and the. The uh, band, you know, the band is phenomenal. Yeah. Just really, so I want to say a special congratulations to them. Yeah, it was and their parents should be very, very proud of them all. Yeah. And they did a great job in the ceremony. Yeah. Standing and, and sitting in <coughs> coordination, and everything went off without a hitch. It was well, fantastic to watch. I'm still talking about, the, yeah, the president was Connor, well, I can't pronounce Rothenblatt. his last name. Yeah. The, 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 the statement that he made was, focus on your character and you'll never have to worry about your reputation. That is a powerful statement mm -hmm. coming from a young man. I was very impressed. That's right. you know? That's great. So thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I, uh, Mike, you just spoke just to um, acknowledge uh, your chairmanship. As I understand it, you were appointed as chairman to succeed uh, um, Paul Siever as the chairman of the Milford Youth Commission. So. Uh, congratulations on that. I know we, I know you, I know you've asked me to uh, to work with the task force there and some perceptions survey information uh, about the youth center and how we can better partner with them. Well, with, uh, through the United Way, we have to lay out a five-year strategic plan for the youth center where we want to be in five years. And so what we've done, reached out. Thank you know you're sitting on the committee with us. Is yeah, Friday, all different Friday. members of of in the community, you know, through their eyes, where do they see the youth center heading? Where does it need to go? What direction and, wh and how it's going to get there in five years? So it's a comprehensive plan. We just started it. So we're meeting just to start. We're meeting every Friday for eight weeks just to start to put the information together for the plan. So it's terrific. But, uh, you know, Paul is a great friend, and, a, and, a, and a, he did a lot for the children in this town. He was a true advocate for children in this community. He really was. Thanks. Yep. And that's all I have tonight for announcements. The, uh, the next item on our agenda is invitation to speak. Did anybody come today to address the committee? I don't see anyone. Uh, so we'll move to our next item, which is the Milford High School uh, Athletic Department Handbook for Athletes and Parents. And we have uh, Mr. Pierre Gustavo to come and speak with us. Hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. Hey, everybody. How are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> 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 and uh, what is that logo on your shirt there, Mr. Pierre Gustavo? This is the Hakamak. Oh, I Lord Hakamak. <laughs> oh, it's the, uh, it's, it's the, lo uh, the logo of the league, and it's one of the perks of being one of the ADs in the Hockamock. You get a free shirt. But um, <laughs> um, One thing on the cheerleaders before we talk about this is um, I think the, the debate is over whether cheering is a sport or if or are they athletes when you actually see them compete. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, and I want to congratulate them publicly as well. That what an amazing, amazing accomplishment uh, to compete at the highest level and do as well as they did. Um, so that debate is over. They're, they're as athletic as any athletes we have in this building by far. Um, and that was a great accomplishment and a nice feather in our cap, Lord Hockamock feather. <laughs> as far as our, our handbook, I, I am going to propose a few changes. Uh, Firstly, we have um, online registration for the first time in athletics, and, and it's, it's, it's been an, it's an excellent addition to how we register athletes. Um, and on page nine, uh, I would like to add uh, the, se uh, the sentence that registration may also be completed online at uh, www.familyid.com. The athletic department will still require a hard copy of the student's most recent physical. We, there's no way to obtain a physical online. We still have to get the hard copy from the physician. And uh, payment as well should probably add that. Um, there is no way to pay online. We take a check or if it's a waiver or cash. Um, so I'd like to add that. The other piece, uh, which is on page 10, um, under the insurance part, currently, um, I think it's in section, page, uh, the, the first paragraph there, and let me double check. Under number one, 
at the end, it says, the last sentence under number one says, uh, the, um, the athletic trainer will forward it to the athlete's parents or guardian. What it's basically talking about is an accident report. When, whenever there's something beyond a Band-Aid or, or a bag of ice, when there's, a, when there's a diagnosed injury, our athletic trainer fills out an injury report. Um, and he keeps them on file. We, we would like to change will forward to the athlete's parents or guardian to will forward to the athlete's parents or guardian at their request. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, uh, our accident insurance policy uh, gives parents the ability to file a, an, a claim if there is an injury. Whether that claim is successful or not, you know, that, that's, up, that's between the, the, the parent and the insurance company. But one of, the, one of the, 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 point, the sticking points is if the injury occurred when they were doing something as a member of the Milford High School Athletic Department. <coughs> and part of what we're trying to do as a culture is to, to and, and, it, and it's not a problem, but it, it's, it, it, it crops its head every now and then. Student athlete gets hurt at practice, says nothing, goes home, comes back the next day, tells the trainer, yeah, I hurt my hand, my wrist at practice yesterday. Well, the tra trainer doesn't know. There's no, there, there was no mechanism. The coach didn't say anything. The kid didn't say anything. He went home, his wrist was sore. Um, we want our kids to see the athletic trainer immediately if they're hurt, if they have an injury that, that needs to be looked at. Um, so this piece where if a parent you know, at their request, meaning they have to kind of buy into this too. The athletic trainer is very qualified. He's, you know, he's probably a few courses away from being a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. He's, he's more than qualified. He could save a trip to the ER. Um, so by kind of putting a little bit of the onus on the parent to seek out the information instead of having it just given to them, kind of we feel, the trainer and I, that um, helps kind of build that culture where we can trust the trainer uh, the trainer knows his stuff, and let's work with the trainer to get your kid back on the field or to say, hey, maybe you should see someone about this. So those were the only two changes that um, I would recommend for the handbook. But they're not changing right now, right? Well, yeah, currently it says we'll forward to the athlete's parents or guardian. Um, we, want, uh, we want to change that to we'll forward it to the athlete's parent or guardian at their request. That's what I meant. You haven't put the change no, in yet. No, no. Okay. And then the addition of the online registration. How many, um, I mean, what was the, I'm, I'm sorry if I don't quite understand the connection between the trainer having an opportunity to work with the student and not having to send a report automatically to the, the parent. I don't quite understand that connection. Well, I, I, think, I think, you know, part of it is that he does, it's not always done in that it's not something that they're going to file a claim. So there's, there's a wrist injury or some lower body injury that, you're not going to see your doctor for. He can say that you're going to be out for a week or two. You know, he's got to make, he's basically trying to make a call. When should I send it? When shouldn't I send it? So instead of that, if, it, if the parent can just come to him and request the information, that makes, that kind of takes the decision away from him on whether he should or shouldn't. How, how many of these reports are filed over the course of a normal school? We year? haven't filed many. You know, this year we filed a few, three or four. You know, it, it's not often. If someone files a claim, it's not often. No, I mean uh, th these reports. How many of these oh, injury reports? reports every time there's a there's an injury beyond a band aid or an ice pack. Can you give me a rough a rough number? It's an estimate. It doesn't um, have to be exact. I, I want to understand. I would say, you know, a couple of week during the course of a season, eight to ten week season, maybe twenty five to thirty injury reports over the course of the year. And, and how much time does each report take on the part of the athletic trainer? Yeah, he, he, he's going to do it regardless, but it does, you know, that, that's part of his, um, his administrative duties at the end of his day or at the beginning of his day. The hour or two before he spends, before he starts taping and getting out the fields, and the hour or two he spends after all, everyone's done at practice or, or games. So the reports will be created regardless. It's They're there for anyone who has had an injury since John's been here. There's mm -hmm. a report there. Has anyone talked to parents about how they feel about <coughs> this type of a change? Uh, not necessarily, no. We really haven't. You know, I think the only time you talk to a parent is when the child is hurt. You know, and like I said, we want kids to feel that they can come to the trainer as option A than 
well, you know, maybe I should, well, my, uh, then the trainer getting a phone call, well, my, I took my son to the, to the ER last night, you know, well, why don't you take him to me first? Well, you know, he said he was fine, but, once you, but he said to have him rest for two weeks. Um, I think we're just trying to open the lines of communication between the parents and the athletic trainer uh, so they know who he is, so they can, you know, trust him that he can make a medical diagnosis, and if he can't, he can send them in the right direction. So. Can we, can we add a sentence or something that says if he feels that the student should seek physical, you know, therapy or see a doctor or something like that, that the parent would definitely be notified in those situations? Well, they, they are. They, they, they are. You know, when, whenever it's something beyond, um, you know, in his judgment, beyond a Band-Aid or an ice pack, there's always a phone call home, always. Okay. Sure. Um, so my, and again, I just want to make sure that I'm following you correctly. So he's creating, or he's seeing this, the athlete writing the report anyways, but we're, at, we're what you're, what we're proposing is, is that it would be, um, we basically are having, asking the parents to proactively request it. Right, My question exactly. would be, why wouldn't we, if we're in, because I'm, I'm in agreement with you, we want to open up the lines of communication. Why would, if it's already created, why wouldn't we just send it? Yeah, we, each time we, we, that, can. we can. That, yeah. I mean, yes, yes. that would just yeah. A fort I'm thinking about it's you know it's one thing with the 18 year olds. We're talking about we've got 14 year old athletes in some cases. A 14 year old can't go to the doctor by themselves, even if a friend gives them a ride, and get to Advil. If they've got an injury that's requiring anything. Anything more than a band-aid or an ice pack, as you said. I mean, I would say, if, it's, if he's already doing all the legwork, hitting send on an email is the least of yeah. is the least amount of work. Increasing that communication. Now we're getting that information out to parents on a proactive basis, rather than because I agree with you. Let's get the parents introduced to who the trainer is. Let's make sure we've got those lines of communication. But let's not make the parents ask because right. <laughs> you've got a high school student. I have a teenage <laughs> daughter. We're thrilled when they remember to tell us what they're, what's what's going on. This makes it proactive. Hey, did you get hurt at practice? Yeah. Right. You all right? Good. That's let's. Well, that that communication is happening. I guess it's just the mechanics of the written report, putting it in the mail and sending it to a parent. And you know, I think sometimes if you have to seek something out, you you know, you take a little bit more ownership of it. I think okay. that's the just rationale. Just, just to piggyback on what uh, Scotty said, is what you could do is we notify the parent, ask the parents if they would want a copy of the report. But I'll make that offer to them first. Well, when, when there's a claim, they get a copy of the report as well as mm -hmm. a claim form that's filled out, and they just have to fill in their information after that. So, um, yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Sure. Uh, excuse me. Just, I just have a, a couple of uh, uh, questions, too, for you, uh, uh, Richie. Uh, when you mentioned, too, on page 9, the um, medical exams, I haven't had a chance to see, even though I have a son that's a senior who did wrestle. I don't. I haven't. I, and I and I mu it must have skipped my mind what that medical form actually looks like. Um, and I, I want to know if, if it's comprehensive enough, uh, because uh, several years well, when I first came on this committee back in 2007, I remember a, a young fella from the Medway area was practicing soccer when he dropped dead, <coughs> and he had that sudden cardiac, uh, that sudden heart attack, or whatever you call it. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest, that uh, it's, it's undetected during a regular, a routine physical e examination. And I remember the committee, um, I'm the only, only member that was on back then, but anyway, uh, the committee agreed to have Hot Screen America come and actually, uh, you know, come and screen athletes <coughs> for the, uh, any underlying causes that may trigger something like this off so it could be caught before it does, you know, have a, a catastrophic uh, uh, ending. Um, we had like 75, 80 kids come, uh, and it was pretty successful. Then I remember the youth center also picked it up, and they <coughs> had it done for the youth sport at, at these as well. Barring that, because it was too expensive, uh, I think it was like $45 a test, and parents had to pay for it themselves. What most physicians or, or most, most school districts are doing throughout the country, from my research, is they're more or less making a more comprehensive uh, medical form where they're asking these pertinent questions that would more or less determine any underlying cardiac uh, uh, risk factors, uh, such as, you know, have you ever passed out uh, during or after exercise? And they list like seven or eight questions there. 
Then they actually go on to ask questions about the family, you know, to see if it's genetic or her, her, her uh, hereditary, where if any family member died suddenly from a heart attack or at a young age. And, and that's how with the doctor, that uh, proverbial red flag would go up and further uh, 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 physical exams would be given to make sure that the child is at least screened for anything like this happening, uh, which is very sad. I, was, I wanted to know if our uh, athletic forms or any of the physical forms include a detailed or a comprehensive questionnaire like that. Well, we have several forms. We have the physical that you would get from your physician. Mm -hmm. um, the information that you're talking about would be in a form that we have. It's a consent to treat form. It basically is, is a couple things. Firstly, it's if a student athlete gets hurt, it gives a ER physician the, uh, the, the, the authority to, to, to perform life-saving um, procedures or what have you. So it's, it, but part of that consent to treat are some questions of underlying conditions, allergies, EpiPens, any. Right. any but but how, how, about, how about those that are actually geared to a, um, any of these, uh, these cardiac risk factors? Um, I, I don't believe there's anything specific. I yeah. think what the athletic trainer is hoping is that if there are issues that he needs to be aware of, that the, the parents are going to make him aware of them. Um, so as far as, you know, I, I, I mm. going back to the online for a second, what, the, the, we, we have to do a concussion history for every season. If you skip a season, you don't see a student athlete. He, maybe he receives a concussion skateboarding, then he, you see him in the spring. So the state mandates that we uh, ask those head injury questions before every season. On the online version, now, and what we discovered, and this is one of the reasons we went online, is that you would have a student athlete in the fall and you would have a few head injuries. And then the parents kind of get sick of filling out the same form and they just say no and they just sign it. So John calls me down his office, he goes, look at this. And, and there was a few that they list all these head injuries back in the fall, but then when we're trying to update them, they say none. Mm. So with the online, you do it once, and then you can add to it. So right. the, the information is much more and that, and that's reliable. Filled, and that's filled up by the parent. That's filled up by the parent, right. yes. What, what I'm suggesting is this is part of the physical exam <coughs> that the physician asks okay. us for the questions, so there is no more or less... Um, you know, play with words or whatever, you know, that a parent would try to do. Some parents would try to protect their kid from keeping them from, from playing. Right. You know, I mean, uh, the hell with the heart, the hell with the head, let's have the kid play. Right. You know, and I've had, in my t years here, I mean, I have seen some parents actually do, do something like that. Um, so that's why this, this here more or less is being proactive because, you know, like you said, sometimes they ask it when you go to the emergency room, but then it's too late because time is of the essence, or even keeping the kid from playing, you know, is, is very important, you know, would more or less would save a life. I mean, there's, how many times have we read in the paper, be it basketball players, uh, and, and they're healthy athletes. You know, that's what they, they, what they appear to be, they're healthy athletes, but yet, they, you know, a lot of them drop dead. I mean, you hear it at least two or three times a year, be it, be it in youth sports or be it in professional sports. And again, they're the best of the best when, when it comes to physical conditioning. And, but yet there's some, some underlying cause that would you know, cause them to, to just drop dead. And sometimes if that's caught, or at least um, a red flag is raised so further investigation can be done, um, that could probably save a life. You know, again, it, you know, it hasn't happened in Milford, God forbid, and I, don't, I hope I don't you know, jinx it, but so, you know, it hasn't, but let's, <coughs> it, it's something that I tried to do when I came on here in 2007 by getting hot screen in here to at least catch that because that young fella in, in Medway really got to me, you know, and, and it's something that I don't want to see happening here. And if there's a way we could more or less address it by just with a questionnaire, I think that'll be great. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about, you know, about it to, to really say mm -hmm. if it's good or bad. I do know you get a physical from a physician that clears them from mm. all activity. Mm. We ask the parents, is there anything that we need to know? Allergies? Yeah. You know, can you know? I, I mm -hmm. don't know. So if the if the trainer gets this information, does he have to make a judgment to hold someone out because there's something on there that maybe causes him alarm? I don't know if we want to mm. put that on the athletic trainer. You well, know. yeah, no, it would probably be on, on the on the on the uh, uh, physician who's given the physical. Right. If you could reach out to Dr. Perriello, Rich, see any help us with the concussion. You don't. You know. 
<laughs> but you don't want athletics to start saying, here's our physical form, uh, make sure, like, this is hi the high school, you have to rely on the doctors to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And you, so I don't know, so then we have the athletics have a physical form that they have to take to their doctors to make sure that they ask all those questions. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to get the kids to do the physical in the 13 months. Um, so I, I don't know. It's a lot. They do it, I know, mm. but to then for have our athletics department now have to come up with a medical form that all these kids have to now take to their doctors, I don't know if it's going to get you the information that you want. Because if a doctor is doing a proper physical, that information should be contained in those medical forms. It hasn't been, which is, which is why article after article says they're, they're, they're making a more, a more comprehensive form because the previous forms didn't address that. I don't know how our athletic department fixes that, though. Rob? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to say, uh, having used the online registration, I think it's wonderful. Long overdue. It worked real nice. You're right. Instead of The getting information's all the, more reliable now, yeah. too. Instead of getting all those papers, you know, there were four or five different color-coded papers that you'd be filling out and signing. It's nice to be able to do it online and, and like you said, have the history there. As you go back in, you log in, your student athlete's information comes up, it's already in there. So you're creating sort of a, a trail of information, which I think is better in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in to Paul and Christine's point, um, yeah, I mean, w w there, is, there isn't a form that the kids are bringing to the doctor right now. Yeah. It, 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 you know, I take my son and daughter to their doctor. I, I sit down with them in the waiting yeah. room and I go through a long questionnaire. Um, you know, that screens for a lot of those things. I mean, are they ever going to be able to screen for every possible thing? You know, probably not. You know, it's gotten longer from what I've seen, which is probably a good, real good thing. But um, I think ultimately the responsibility definitely is with the physician and having to give a thorough physical examination in history of, of that child and, and saying whether or not they're capable of playing. Again, if, I think if we try to get into the business of saying, well, they filled out this form and, you know, how comprehensive is that form going to be? Are we putting ourselves in a position of liability, I guess? No, I, I, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no, um, um, Robbie, I don't think so. It's just, it's just a matter of several questions that raises the red flag. Depends how they answer them. Again, it's all on, on how they answer a survey. You know that 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 helps a lot, but you know I think it's just um, it more or less would more or less, um, make raise the awareness, you know, uh, about a, a specific individual when they are giving a physical, and if and if the red flag comes up, maybe further um, investigation is, is needed. May, it may and maybe it's not. I mean, it's just one way. Again, it's not a cure-all. It's not 100%. It's probably just a few percent above what we're doing now, but it's, but it's better than what we're doing now. That's all it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. If you want, I could send you some information that I've gotten, you know, from, from various school districts across the uh, country that they're starting to, to do. Uh, just, uh, again, just an idea for you to, to think about. And, and I, I think these are all great discussions because, you know, I think... The reason we're in this business is to help protect our kids and, and educate our kids. And mm -hmm. if we can help one kid from suffering a catastrophic, you know, injury, then that that would be a good thing. So, absolutely. I'm sorry, no, Christine. No, no, I was, no, I was no. running for money to something else. But okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I just before I forget about the online system. Do you ever anticipate being able to pay through the online system? Because I know that a lot of people are like, well, you go on, you register, and then you stop, and right. you're so used to like kind of going through the whole process. So I don't know if that's ever going well, to be an we, option we did or this is it We did this quickly. Okay. To, and, and my discussion with Family ID was, well, we'll just wait to do it till the fall. She goes, no, do it in the spring because the fall is the busiest time. Get your feet wet. Oh, this is the first, this spring season is the, the spring first time season, you did it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I and then um, we'll, we're going to have further discussion about PayPal, and I talked to Kathy briefly about PayPal. Yeah, so I just know a lot of people were asking option. me, like, Believe you kind of I, I would love thing. to not have to chase kids for a check. I Believe know. me, I would, I would love for that. Your, it's just but like there are other issues. If, if, if there's a waiver, you know, yep. um, you know I, I don't know how we control that, but we're going to talk about it further. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. You cool. can... Yeah. Michael, let me just ask you one question only because I saw it again this morning on the news protocol. 
Of course, everybody knows about the collegiate basketball player that's leg got snapped the mm. other night. And I was thinking as I saw them taking him out of the gym and everybody around the gurney, what is our protocol? Say an accident like that was to happen in the gym. Like at what point does the trainer, is the trainer involved, you know, all the way through? As you say, he's one step away from being a nurse practitioner. Does he step away when the first responders get here? Does he stay? He, he works, <coughs> he'll work with them. Okay. And, you know, he's, he's a source of valuable information. We had a head injury this past winter, so, um, you know, 911. And um, he's working with them initially and then, you know, then to the EMTs and then to the hospital. But um, if there's a previous head injury, he would know that immediately. If there's other issues, he would, he would know that. Um, one of the things that he does is he, uh, for, each, for each team, he has kind of a card on who might have an EpiPen, who might do this, who might okay. have that. So um, he is the first one on scene, and then he's a valuable source of information when the EMTs get there, and then he kind of passes them. So there, is, there are protocols for when he's on site. If he's not on site, all our coaches are concussion certified. They've all had first aid, uh, CPR. Um, so I don't, I don't have it to memory, but um, there is a procedure if there's an injury. Thank you. Thank you. I just saw all these people yeah. around as he was being pulled out of the gym, and I was saying, you know, somebody's got to be in charge of this whole, you know. Right. And, you know awful accident. Awful. Yeah, Richie, yeah, thank you. I, I was just going to ask, uh, Richie, uh, uh, when I brought up a few uh, months ago with um, uh, Kathy uh, regarding the catastrophic uh, health insurance or medical insurance, uh, let's say, for high school athletes who suffer a catastrophic injury uh, that could result in paralysis or brain injury. And I remember reading once that a um, paralysis injury could cost over a million dollars the first year. And there was a young fella who got uh, hit in uh, Chicago who just died last winter uh, who was alive for 10 years. And in, um, that school fortunately had a policy of $5 million for catastrophic health insurance. And um, he used most of it up in his last two years. Um, he had no money. The family was on the poor farm because of, the, because of this uh, problem that they had through no fault of theirs. And uh, they lost their home and all that. And the young fella ended up dying. And now I believe the state of Illinois is trying to get that passed statewide. Um, and I just wanted to ask if um, there's a possibility if, because um, I know Kathy was saying you guys tried your, your donness, you gave it a bona fide effort, and uh, nothing came to and be. And this I guess. was to see if someone would insure us beyond a year. Beyond the year, right, right. right. And, I, and I know uh, NCAA has a $20 million policy per athlete from mutual of, um, of that neutral of what neutral of, Omaha. of Omaha right I drew a blank but but anyway yes um, uh, uh, and, and I know uh, what this um, district in Illinois is doing to help the legislature in that state is they came up with several insurance companies who do carry that type of policy which I could you know forward to you later well I'm thinking um, and I, I might have misunderstood I thought part of what we were doing is to see if we can get insured for more than a year and I was and I mm -hmm. went to several companies and it's it would be unheard of for an insurance company to give you more than a one-year policy because then they, they do an audit yeah. see how many claims that you have and that could increase or, you know your right. premium. Right. This I believe would but be a special policy. In, in, increasing the um, the uh, the payment for catastrophic injury I, I, I didn't even think about doing that but I'm sure you can if you're willing to pay, you right. could probably and, have... And I remember one superintendent in the school, in fact, the superintendent where this fella died, the young fella died, uh, he got it for the whole district of 6,000 kids. And I believe for 6,000 kids, it was a little over $12,000, which I believe <coughs> they have an active booster club between that and raising the tickets, uh, you know, a, a dollar or so, helped defray that cost. You know, so um, uh, it, it, it's a big de deductible because it's, it's, it pays so much, you know, and I guess it continues. It's like a $10 million policy that they had, which could, have, which could be used over a period of time. Again, God forbid it happens so in to, to this town, you know, but it's something that, uh, um, you know, it, it's just something to be prepared for because I don't think any family can really afford a million dollars just on, on the first year of, uh, of, of, in of insurance for what they need for a spinal cord, in, you know. Well, I think we could, we could, you know, tell them what we want and they would just set the rate based mm -hmm. on that. And then we'll sure see we how could. it is. 
Okay. Thank that, you. That would obviously cost more, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, thank yeah, you. I was I was a huge proponent of that, Paul. When you first mentioned it, I think it's mm -hmm. a terrific idea, and I think if there's any sort of manner or means that we could employ to try and get that done, um, I would certainly like to investigate it. So if there are some more avenues now after speaking with Paul. Um, that we can look into to finding a way to make that sort of catastrophic injury coverage occur. I mean, I think that would be a very a positive thing for our district. Well, we, we have one, but to increase it, right, I exactly. think it's a million, three million right now. I'm not 100%. For one year. For one year, right. right. Not how much, one million? So one million for one year. The difficulty was going beyond the one year, which is part of our issue. So can I ask a quick question? Are you insured by the number of athletes, or is it just a policy for your athletic department? Just like, I, is it per athlete or? It's a blanket. No, it's, for the, it's a for blanket. anybody who's covers, involved in the athletics. It covers the student athletes, the cheerleaders, Cheaters, and the everybody. marching band members. Oh, okay. So it's, I, I understand. Uh, Rich, a little over a year ago, um, you came in and asked us to adopt a policy where we had, where we gave you some more leeway in deciding what punishments would be um, for, for students, and, and we did do that. And I'm. I'm not necessarily a, a fan of a, a hard line, no exceptions policy anyway. So I, at the time, I thought it was a good idea. I was wondering to give us an update on how that's been applied, how it's working for you, and if you're comfortable with the way the policy is currently enacted. Well, um, we're talking about the chemical health rule. The, 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 the discipline policy, I would call it. I'm not sure what you would call it. It's uh, the chemical health rule was changed. Well, the, the rule hasn't changed, but the policy um, changed in that um, it was, I believe, you were guilty by association. Correct. And that that w was around for probably a year or two before that. It was the MIA policy that was you cannot be rendered guilty by association. It'd be an investigation, and so forth and so on. I think um, I think working with the assistant principals and working with the Milford Police Department. You know, I. <coughs> To, to say that, you know, is there a better way? I don't, I don't know if there is. Is it perfect? I don't think it is either. Um, I think we rely on other information. We, we rely on the, uh, the, say, testimony of individual student athletes or others. And um, it becomes hearsay a lot of times unless there's physical evidence. Um, we do have a memorandum of understanding with the Milford Police Department that we, that we work together on these types of issues. I think it's, I still think it's better than a, than a blanket you're rendered guilty by association. And the example that I gave you was the young person that was, had a choice to make in the situation where a friend was passed out <laughs> drunk and if that person decided to leave, who knows what the result would have been. Well, the fact, the matter that person wasn't drinking, wasn't participating, did the right thing, called 911, but because this person was there, suffered the consequences. And we didn't want that to ever be a decision on, on a young person. Okay, do I, even though I do not drink or whatever, I have to make a decision. Do I leave this person here or do I, do I run away? And in this case, this person made the right decision because first time drinker, I gave you the example, it was hard alcohol and who knows what could happen, you pass out. So um, I don't think there's a perfect solution. No, I, I, I don't think there's a perfect solution. I guess what my question is, is are you seeing fewer violations? Is the investigation taking up more time than you would have anticipated? It, is it, it something that's difficult to administrate? Yeah, we, we, we haven't had many incidents, but you know, it is, uh, it is, does take longer. It takes Ms. Banach, Mr. McIntyre, takes away from their day, takes away from my day. Um, I guess my, my ultimate frustration is there really isn't a perfect solution. I think um, it's like trying to prevent catastrophic injury. It's like trying to, you know, we, we look at our kids. I look at our kids in this building and we would hope that they would make the right decision. We would hope that they wouldn't do anything to put themselves or others at risk. And then you just kind of keep your fingers crossed. Um, and the message is always, when it's myself and Ms. Banach, myself, Mr. McIntyre, um, is that you know this is you know these are life-changing decisions potentially. Uh, do you understand? We know what it's like to be a teenager. You know, try to plead to their sense of reason to 
to understand. But, you know, and I also believe that ultimately um, the parents, you know, have to take responsibility for their kids. Um, so you, you go back and forth. Yeah, it does take a little bit more time, and it's definitely not perfect. I don't think there's any perfect solution. Um, but we would hope for the best for all our kids, and ultimately that, um, you know, uh, that one's character comes through and, um, and they, do, uh, they do the right thing, not always what's easy. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've never been a proponent of zero tolerance policies, and, and I'm still not. I think sometimes we enact policies here as a committee, and so often we don't get feedback on how they're actually applied. So I think, I think what I'm interested in is, is making sure that we know how that's burdening your department, uh, what type of time that's taking up with some of our assistant principals. We want to make sure that there isn't something that we can do to streamline that policy to make it work better. Um, I think very often we put a policy in place and we get no feedback from it. So yeah, the, the zero to tolerance is much easier. You know, right, we, police reports. which which is why I asked the question. Right, right. it's yeah. much easier. This um, and I, and I guess you know why why do the MIA have these rules? What what are the things that keep parents up at night? Like what do we worry about ultimately at the end of the day? And it's our kids, and we worry about them making the right decision. And um, you know, some kids step up big time, and other kids kind of disappoint you. But that's life, and we just hope those that you know make those wrong decisions learn from those decisions and and try not to make them again. Um, but it's not easy, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, we have non-athletes that can, you know, can partake in certain behaviors and there is no punishment because it's not part of school, you know. So we try to communicate to our athletes that they are held to a higher standard um, because that because it's important because we can't control everybody and everything. <coughs> so um, we're doing our best. I can promise you that. Any other members have questions of Rich? I just have one question. The concussion policy, how long ago did we institute that, and, and well, what are your numbers? We, we um, well, we started that before it was a law. We did it. Right. We got a year head start. And uh, <laughs> compared to where we were uh, in after the fall season, we're about where we were the, the year okay. that the policy changed. Right, right, because I think the mandate is like a six-month review. Is that correct? I think it's yearly. It's in June. Bob, yeah. I think you get yeah, that. Yeah, we have. I, I asked Judy. That. Yeah, Judy think it's submitted that recently. So you're not seeing yearly. any increase. There, there is no increase. We're decrease. not seeing a decrease either. So you know, kind of are there funny. some kids that are hiding symptoms? Are there some kids that are right. using it as, as an out? Absolutely. I think that's always been the case in athletics. Some kids will never tell you. Right. And sometimes those symptoms aren't as clear as mm -hmm. we wish them to be. We have, um, we have, uh, what's the what's the cognitive test uh, impact yeah. as an option? We don't make we it a requirement, but that's that. Who does the impact testing? The athletic trainer does, okay, and we make okay. it available to all our athletes, and they can sign up. And um, we've had some kids use it, then they get retested, and yeah. it's just another tool. Yeah. Um, and to Paul's point, you know, anything mm -hmm. to help keep kids a little bit safer. Sure. Um, just to tag on to that with a concussion policy, my understanding was because I think it was like my second meeting on the board. Uh, my understanding of that policy is that <coughs> it's set up that um, it's almost like a strike rule where. Once you have right. a certain number of concussions, you're then, reg regardless of whatever a physician says, they're out for at least one year. Is that correct? I think it's if it's on the third one. I believe yeah. I don't. Yeah, know. It's yeah, I, I believe it's, it's a three. It's similar to a three strike yeah. rule, basically. Um, has that happened? Have you have, no, have we, we had to go had to that room? We haven't had a third concussion yet. Okay, which we've had we've had a couple good. of twos, yeah. Um, yeah. but we haven't had a third. Okay. Thank you. And, and the more that you hear about, you know, the, the protective measures, the more you realize that there is nothing that can protect you from a concussion. I don't care no. if you yeah. design a helmet; it's it's just um, it's just one of those things. And um, but the numbers really haven't changed; mm. they're kind of the same. How about know. across sports? I am about this about the same. We we did see. Uh, like some sports are more prone than others, not necessarily well, the ones you see, think. You no, know, we, we saw a few more, I think, girls' soccer, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple that's more. That's a big one. You know, they talk about the neck and yeah. all those yeah. Yeah, things. Yeah, and they're going to outlaw hitting the ball soon, I hear, but I don't know how they can do that. But um, what well, comes to your head in the game, I don't know what they're going to yeah. do. Yeah. So. And I would imagine more often than not, just from a personal experience, somebody that's played the sport for 30 years, it's more often than not you don't get a concussion from heading the ball. It's your step on the way when somebody's shooting. 
It's right. the ball off the head that hurts. It's not the one that it's you're trying the to collision. do. It. The collision. Yeah. yeah. Or the head we to head. A, we had a slide. We might have had one today at lacrosse. It was a, a, a posing athlete, but it's a collision. Mm -hmm. Two athletes going for the ball. Mm -hmm. Scary stuff. Well, I'll just bring up one more point, I guess. I, I had had an opportunity to talk to Rich about it um, previously. I had gotten some inquiries from parents um, asking, you know, in a contact sport such as football, you're providing equipment, you're providing a helmet, mm -hmm. shoulder pads, in this case specifically <coughs> a helmet to protect against concussions. And, they'll, you know, the question came up, my son or daughter plays lacrosse, if they play hockey, why isn't the school providing a helmet? And they said, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Obviously, you know, there'd be an exorbitant cost associated with that. Um, you know, it would it would be something that I would like to see us maybe look into in the future, or maybe come up with creative ways of partnering with charitable organizations. Where even if you're not supplying every kid with one, you know, if we can be getting a, you know, if there are ways that we could be getting you know X amount of them donated or something, might be something worthwhile looking into because. You know, I, you know, from personal experience, I know some of these, some of this equipment <laughs> that the kids use nowadays is very expensive, mm -hmm. right. you know, even for the families. But I throw it out there just that, you right. know, I don't know if you have any comments. Well, well, I, know I no do. Quick like answer. It, it, first of all, we would be probably one of the only, if not the only school to provide helmets for lacrosse and ice hockey. Uh, both of those sports in particular, um, most of the kids in those sports play m multiple seasons. Mm -hmm. Lacrosse kids are normally multiple season kids. Ice hockey are even more multiple sport kids. We do have, I'll, I can give you a few examples of when we did scrounge up some equipment for some kids in both sports that couldn't afford to buy it, and it was good stuff. Whether it was something a little bit older, the coach had, they knew someone who wasn't playing anymore, so we, t we tend to make that work. Um, the game officials, it's their responsibility to make sure that all the equipment is certified. You know, um, you know, I don't think any of our coaches would allow our kids to, to play those collision sports without no, equipment. Right, but right. we would be the only school district that would provide those. None of the Hawk schools provide lacrosse helmets or hockey helmets. Um, or shoulder pads for that matter. You know, hockey especially, you're gonna buy everything mm -hmm. except your uniform yeah. and that's mm -hmm. very expensive. Um, but um, but there, are inst there are instances where we know that someone wants to play, they don't have stuff and we'll find it. By hook or by crook, we, we get yeah. them equipment so they can yeah. play. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and, and again, you know, m I, I take a lot of pride in Milford's the first to do a lot of things. <laughs> and, and I'm not suggesting this may be one of them. And again, for our taxpayers, listening and paying attention, I know there is a great cost. I'm not suggesting that we run out and buy them, but again, it's something to be aware of and w when and where there might be opportunities, like you had mentioned, to get some used or secondary donated equipment that, you know, meets the standards that's required. You know, maybe we can have a little inventory of sure. that that we, that we maintain. Sure. So. But like those multiple, uh, or those multi-season lacrosse players want their own because yeah. they use it for their club I, I, team I and get the hockey that. kids. I, I get Same that. With the hockey. Not, <laughs> yeah. It's unlikely to get a kid starting to play hockey in high school. Yeah, it would, you wouldn't be able yeah. to probably do it. Right. Yeah. 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 But lacrosse, probably, probably, probably yeah, 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 you get more kids in yeah. lacrosse. But and then that's been those sports. instances where <coughs> we have found equipment, good equipment yeah. to give to the kids who want to try lacrosse. Right. And it's still a budding sport. It's still yeah. fairly new for yeah. us. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think that's why it probably came up was with it's lacrosse, and lacrosse it, it is fairly yeah, new, and it is on the rise. So, yeah. But I, I, I would never want to create an atmosphere that we would exclude anyone for any reason right. at any time. And I, I hope, and I know our coaches have their finger on the pulse of their given sport community, mm -hmm. and know that if there is mm -hmm. someone that's interested, you know, hopefully our kids will tell us who these people are, if there are any that, well, it's you know, we can't afford to. to, to to play that that is never an issue. We, we can't buy the equipment. We'll get you the equipment. You know, hopefully we've created an atmosphere where people aren't afraid to come in and even ask. And we've had calls, and it's I'm, I'm sure that's never an easy phone call for that person to make to mm -hmm. say that listen, we can't afford yeah. to buy equipment. But 
rest assured we'll find it and uh, we want our kids playing stuff Good. no matter what it is well, well I think just getting that out there was worth Absolutely. having brought it up and having the conversation Absolutely. thank you yeah. <coughs> So we have uh, we do require a vote on this handbook, uh, and I would like to take the vote actually in in, in two motions. And the reason is, Rich, I, I I understand why you don't want to send those reports because nine times out of ten, the parents having the conversation with the student, and it's just another piece of mail right. from the school that they throw away. On the other hand, of course, I, I realize that we're writing this report anyway, and for the hundred dollars in postage and stationery every year, um, I would hate to close a line of communication that we have. Um, going out to those parents, and so that's that, that's my opinion. So I would like to um, entertain these two these two uh, changes in two motions. Um, so for the first change, um, to put uh, to add the online registration to the manual. I have a, a motion from Rob, second from Don, to accept that change. And is there any discussion on that motion? Okay. So all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous in favor. The motion carries. Um, and for the second motion. Um, I wanted to know if there was a member that wanted to motion for that change, if there was further discussion, or how you wanted to, to take that motion. Yeah, I, I'd like to motion there would be a proactive. We'd send the that we'd send out the report each time it's each time it's issued. Which would be a motion for no change to, to the manual. Correct. Christine, discussion. Um, I just want to say, I'm trying in my head to articulate. I, I think I know what you're trying to get. I think it just needs to be clearer, more clearly articulated because. You have so many different injuries on a field that there's a gradation. And some, you know, it's going to be obvious. The athletic trainer is going to talk to the parent right then and there. Right. Others, there's going to be situations where you want the parent to come. And I just think, I think if it's just the language is another sentence or two, it can tighten up the language so that it can work both ways. So I, I don't know if there's grades of an injury, severity of an injury, or somehow how the trainer triages his injuries. Well, e even if it's a muscle pull, let's say. Right. A muscle pull isn't, you know, a catastrophic injury. But, um, you know, it, it could be a situation where there has to be communication because this student athlete has to ice. They have to stretch. They have to take yeah. home the rehab sheet that he gave, and, and there is communication there. Other times it's like, ah, oh, you know, you'll be back in a couple of days. It doesn't need to be. The communication and, and that's and I I understand that because I, I mean kids come off the field and right. sore tonight well it's, you just you know you bumped your leg funny or someone you know like I know at a game someone got hit badly with a lacrosse stick and they had a big bump but that doesn't require a big exchange it just you know go home and ice it right um, so I know that there's different triage of it I don't know if if it solves a problem by just co going back to the trainer and just being like let's see if we can just tighten it up and I don't think you need to send it out to everything that happens on the field. I, I don't. I well, think. I think the this the, and just correct me if I'm wrong. The language is not cleaning up whether or not we're creating the report. This no. is the report's created. The report's created. What we're essentially saying is when the report gets created, send no, them all. Send it to the parents. And you said it was 25 to 30 a season, correct? 25 to 30 a year. I thought you said. No, no, no. In, injury season. injury reports. Yeah. yeah. Like that he's creating that those reports for. Yeah. Well, if there's 10 weeks, mm -hmm. it's 30. Okay. So, so, so we're 25 to 30 a season, so we're talking 90 a year, so it's, you know, it's 90 letters and 90 stamps. Yeah, so it's $13 stamps, a season. Yeah. But you're making the report. It's about communication, is what it's about. He, yeah. he is, but... It's increased well, commu clear communication I to the parents. What? I, you know, may, maybe part of it is that, you know, to, to open the line of communication between parent and athletic trainer, number one. Number two is him having to make a judgment to, you know... If he should call, he shouldn't call. He's do he's he's making those judgments. I think he feels that sometimes um, he's getting yeah okay whatever click on the other end. Kind of thing. So, but this this is I mean this is talking about sending a report, and so you right. said that we were sending a report, and so you wanted to stop sending that report. I haven't heard anything that would convince me that there's any reason why we should stop sending okay. out 90 reports. Every, I mean I'm not again I understand why, and I know for probably. 85% of those parents, again, it's just a piece of paper that they'll throw away. But what we're talking about is closing a line of communication that's currently open. I just, I don't, I don't, it hasn't been made clear to me, and maybe Christine's right. If we can redraft it and we can have different language on it, then, then maybe that's okay too. I mean, this language I, I wouldn't support uh, as it stands today. Um, you know, I don't want to speak Mr. for you. Yeah, I think, Rich, the hard thing is, is how, would, how would he determine what he's going to send and what he's not going to send? And I agree with the chairman. I would, for safety, I would rather send just everything. send, send it. everything and yeah. then you get, you're get you covered because, God forbid, he doesn't, he makes a judgment call and doesn't send one. You know, the liability right. could be mm -hmm. tremendous, you know. So if he's, if he's doing the report anyway, whether he's going to put it in a jacket or he's going to send it, you know what, send them all, everybody's covered. 
That's my take on it. Any other members have comments? Paul? I second, second the, mo the motion. Okay. So, uh, so the, the, the motion is to make no change uh, on item number two. Uh, all in favor of making no change for item number two? All opposed? So we have uh, six in favor. Um, Ms. Boyle is opposed. Uh, the motion does carry. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rich. Thank you so much. The next item on our agenda is the special education programs update. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, ladies. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for wearing the ribbons in support of our students. Yeah. And the shirt. And the shirt. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. And I guess after seeing our students, you understand why Meg and I love our jobs. Exactly. Right. exactly. You just saw them. They're great. Um, and one of the things this week that on our April 2nd, which was World Autism Awareness Day, we did an event with Sensibility Gym in Hopedale. And it was great. We had um, families come out. Um, Bob came as well as uh, State Representative Fernandez and Senator Moore, which was very nice in support of our school system and the gym in Hopedale. And it was it was a nice event for the families to be able to connect and the kids to be able to play and have a place that they can go and have that experience of being in a gym that's um, around sensory. Uh, driven children that need these outputs so it was a great event and we were happy to do it and we hope to partner with them we're hoping to maybe do some field trips with them um, or actually therapy sessions with our occupational therapist or physical therapist but that's in the works so um, could you talk a just a little week. bit more about that facility I, I wanted mm -hmm. to come and I got the invite and thank you I unfortunately had another commitment but okay. could you talk a little bit more about that that facility sure I, yeah. um, it's a nonprofit gym that opened up in January and it's called sensibility gym so everything in it is about um, sensory uh, items in the gym that the children that a lot of children with a diagnosis of autism or even other disabilities for that matter um, they they thrive on things around <coughs> sensory so there's a swing in the gym there's a ball pit um, there's uh, a certain kind of slides for the kids there's a quiet room some kids are too distracted by a lot of noise so they have different they have a bubble machine in there they have um, quiet activities, bean bags, if they like a tight squeeze to, to help their body calm down. There's actually a squeeze machine, which um, Bob Mr. actually Trimbley demonstrated for us. Um, <laughs> so it's like a school committee meeting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have photos if you'd I like to see them. We took a lot of photos, so yeah, yeah, we have yeah. those. If you want me to send those off, let me know. <laughs> um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let me know. I'm happy to help. Senator Moore refused to go through the machine. Yes, yeah. yeah, Senator yeah. Moore did not want to go through. Um, <laughs> but it, overall, uh, that's the idea behind the gym. So, And also, what's nice is a lot of gyms um, targeted to uh, general population or, or children, they don't uh, necessarily have um, the equipment that these children would really feel comfortable with. And then this is also a place where they don't feel any pressure. They can be themselves. They don't have to worry about um, in not being able to control their bodies and they have about 10 kids uh, at a time in the gym with their families so it's it's an opportunity for them to just be themselves and, and not worry so great. it's a great place if you have a chance to go see it um, we'll hopefully do other events there with them so there'll be other opportunities they were right who more or less uh, addresses the symptoms or the uh, uh, mm -hmm. aspects of uh, that uh, con condition and uh, it was recognized by the Flutie Foundation mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty good. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. They're off to a great start. Um, so basically tonight what we wanted to do is go through the different schools and some different updates that are uh, going on throughout the district and then also talk about some initiatives that have already taken place and some that are coming in the future. Um, and then the other thing is just a, a quick update on numbers, which I'm sure you um, received the handouts. Um, so first and foremost, we'll start with Shining Star. One of the things at Shining Star this year, we have a number of grants for our early childhood, but a new one this year that came through um, is an early childhood grant that what we're going to do with that money, it's about $4,200. We're going to buy assessment tools that will be screeners for school predict 
predicting school success. So it's going to look at physical development, language, academics, self-help, and social-emotional. So that's um, something that we're looking forward to putting in place. We have many assessments at the preschool level, but this is a, a newer assessment, and we thought that um, this would be a good way to use the grant money. And we'll also start um, with a new assessment from zero to 36 months. Typically, we start a little older than that um, with our assessment tools, but now we're even going to start even younger. Um, another thing that we've done, you've heard a lot about PBIS throughout the district. What we've done now is we've brought PBIS down to the preschool level. So just for the benefit of, of anybody who's watching, can you just what is PBIS? Try to avoid acronyms as oh. much as okay. possible. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and just um, what is PBIS? Yep, um, Positive Behavioral Interventions. Thank so uh, Jennifer Cutler and Donna Hennessy have been on the forefront of that and they have helped us now um, bring the preschool on board. So now the great thing about it is we are now pre-K through eight and we're going to start using grant money this summer to put a team together for the high school. So we will be pre-K through 12 um, in about a year. In a meeting I attended yesterday, the district meeting, um, uh, Carrie Bonnock from the high school was mm -hmm. present actually at that meeting, Great. representing the high school. So right. it, the high school's already on their way to being part of that. So. Awesome. Yeah, that would, be, uh, that would be phenomenal. So everybody will be on the same page, and they'll start from the time they enter our school system all the way through the high school. Um, the other thing, uh, we had a couple staff attend a conference um, through Mich Michelle Garcia Winner, and she's a leading expert with social skills <coughs> and social development. So we had our speech and language therapist at the preschool level and our board certified behavior analyst go to this conference to bring that back um, to the children at the preschool level because we know that early indicators, the earlier that we can help and intervene with the children, the more success we shall see. Um, the other thing <coughs> that uh, Deb and I, in meeting with the staff this year, have noticed is that a lot of the iPads that are in the district, whether they're one-to-one -one with students or even in our classrooms, a lot of the teachers are so grateful to have it, but now it's, we're at the point of what's next? What do we, how can we make sure that this is successful and we're putting everything we need into this? So we um, searched out a consultant and we have consultants from Cotting School that have met with us a couple times about where do we go next as far as management of all the iPads in the district, management of what's going on the iPads, um, what's appropriate for the iPads uh, academically, um, whether it's even regular ed or special ed, Title I. So there are all of these different conversations happening. So that's actually been uh, a really nice mm -hmm. thing this year for us to try to say, okay, we have however many in the district now, a, a lot, um, probably close to 100 <coughs> iPads throughout the district. So now we're, we really got to start to hone in and make sure that we're being successful, so. And, excuse me, Mick, yep. and these consultants are going to the schools, looking at the students with the iPads and making suggestions to the teacher, to the speech therapist, what apps would be the best to use because we have all them, but now let's use them appropriately. It's not only for speech. Some iPads are used just for the students to help them speak, but others are for language-based, and so when they've been they've been really. When we first started with the iPads in the special education, mm -hmm. uh, we were sort of on the leading edge of school districts that were doing yes. that, and I know Apple came and took an interest, yeah. and they made a video. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. is there any sort of a ongoing partnership or any programs through Apple or with the educational arm of of Apple Corporation that we've been taking advantage of or looking at, or is that something that really isn't applicable to our district? No, it definitely, um, we have someone that we work with with Apple that primarily that will go to for pricing and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a volume account for where we purchase apps through. Mm -hmm. And in this particular consultation that we've done with Cotting, they have stated to us in the districts that they work with, we are ahead still. We have more um, iPads going throughout the school. Uh, some school districts have done this one-to-one -one initiative, mm -hmm. but more about how we've been utilizing them in Milford, if it's one-to-one -one with the student and special education-wise, or a lot of the classrooms, or even in um, Brookside and Memorial, 10 bundles of 10 iPads, the teachers can check them out, or even at um, East, another 10 were bought for science. So they've said to us, they feel as though we're still ahead of the game. So. For us, it was difficult to find a consultant that could help us stay ahead of the game. Sure. Um, so in speaking to them, they also have said, you know, you can reach out to Apple again. I wasn't in this position at the time of when Apple came, um, but I can certainly look into who that person was at that 
point in time. Yeah, I, I don't know, know if you know Bob. Uh, Rob, Rob, Rob something. Cohen. Rob Cohen from oh. Apple. We have a contact information. He was like the sales. Yeah, he was like the sales. Yeah. Like the sales, yeah. sales yeah. For that. Yeah. I'm happy to reach out and see. Yeah. Just, just to comment on that, if I, if I may, that it's your presentation, but I think it's an important point to underscore is that other districts like Burlington and other school district leaders around the state that are taking iPad initiatives, Milford is not behind in that regard where we're saying no it's to the comment that I made some meetings right. ago saying I'm not interested in that. We want to make sure we roll it out where it's driven by real student need and mm -hmm. staff's ability to deliver using those tools. I think all too often districts spend the money on giving that I iPad devices or whatever the device might be. There's not a good plan in place as to how to use it. Mm -hmm. Curriculum is not clearly identified and it's a waste of money in many respects. Uh, so I want it's important mm -hmm. for the public to know that Milford is not behind in that regard and, and I'm glad no, you brought up that point we're that we're using it and we're, we're rolling it out carefully strategically yeah. mm -hmm. and where it's appropriate so I'm glad, you, I'm glad you pointed that out Meg. Absolutely. Thanks. and one of the nice things even to like if a classroom has a set of iPads and the teacher says oh but I want you know um, these apps put on here and we have like they've put in place a rubric for us to look at so the teacher can say oh okay I can look at this app I can look at the rubric go through and see if it's going to be meaningful for my class so it's things like that management wise that I believe this year we've made a lot of progress with so we'll continue with that and I'm happy to reach out to Rob or the contact name that you have sure and in our off uh, office we keep very good track of who has it what's on and with the help of Vinny uh, Kiso who helps program some of this stuff so we're very well, well aware it's just not being we know what's getting on those apps you know for mm -hmm. our students and what's important right um, and then going into the elementary schools uh, a couple things this year uh, that we have moved towards with Bob's meetings every month with the curriculum team leaders. One of the things that we've not just uncovered, but, but actually put some more effort into finding out how to make programs more consistent. And one of the um, CTLs reached out, or actually a group of them, for English language arts, is they wanted to see what we were doing across special ed for reading. So what, ha what we've done is they actually created a spreadsheet. And so we, they went through Memorial, they went through Brookside, they went through Woodland. And so we're going to look across and make sure that the children from very early on when they've entered into special education, what their program looks like all the way through up till Stacy. Um, so that's something we're, <coughs> we're continuing with. Uh, mm -hmm. PBIS training, positive behavioral interventions, um, mm -hmm. will continue on. <laughs> um, again, the iPad consultation. And then one of the other uh, things that has come up this year are schedules. So when we have children leave uh, Memorial and go to Woodland, and then when we have children from Brookside go to Woodland, one of the things that we keep talking about is that transition. What does that look like? So their program at Brookside and their program at Memorial, well, now they're all in one classroom at Woodland. So we w we're working on scheduling of what that looks like and their transition plans. Um, the other thing that Deb and I have started to look at in the last month is uh, especially around budget season and, and, the, and the different things we come to all of you for um, mm. and the hopes of support. We want to make sure that our resources are being used adequately <coughs> across the district. Mm -hmm. So that's something else that we've been tackling. Meg, this probably isn't a question for you. It's probably a question for Bob. Bob, I can see that we have the iPad consultation in Shining Star and then again in the elementary schools. <clears throat> now, how are we controlling that as a cost center? Do we have uh, a special education ID that we use to control the purchase of these apps, or is there one for each school mm -hmm. building? How are we handling Because that's something that's going to be a larger part mm -hmm. of our budget moving right. forward, so I think it's best if we're controlling that in a, in a manner now. I, I can address it to begin with. I'll turn it over to Kathy, though, for this for that question in terms of apps and the purchasing of, mm -hmm. is that what you mean, for the apps? How are we controlling costs? Yeah. Which, how are we allocating mm -hmm. it to the proper school? How do we know? Right. So right now that's being managed through the Special Education yeah. Office. Uh, and all of with them. The, all yep. of them. Yeah. yeah. But one, the, one thing, sorry to interrupt no, you. No. Um, one thing, for example, Patty Kelly reached out and said, I have a grant. I'm going to buy um, a certain amount of money for apps. And I said, that's perfectly fine. We can use the volume purchase account. You, and at this point in time, you can say, okay, I have this amount. So we're happy to manage that. But as it gets bigger and gets into the different schools, mm -hmm. is that yeah. what you're? Well, I, I think also, yeah. too, you know, we're going to have, it's, it's very important to us that we're able to, you know, accurately track what's happening on a cost side in the mm -hmm. special education department mm -hmm. and to be able to say these app purchases were for special education in the Shining Star building. Mm -hmm. These were these purchases, although they may have been on the same iPad, uh, you know, 
certain portion of them are special education and another portion of them are math or science. Mm -hmm. And I'm right. wondering if we have a comprehensive scheme set up so we're accurately tracking this sort of stuff. Um, and if we don't, that's okay, but it's something that we need to... Yeah, yeah absolutely, right. I think right now, um, most of the purchases are being spent through grants. Mm -hmm. We yeah. haven't done any local no. funding for any of the uh, purchase for the applications. But to Meg and Deb's point, as that grows, that will become a building reportable mm -hmm. expense through the end of the year report that we will have to manage because mm -hmm. essentially it's uh, software mm -hmm. and instructional expense by building by grade mm -hmm. and you have to report it as such. Well and then I would also see it moving forward by building by grade by mm -hmm. teacher. I mean we're going to have right. certain teachers who want right. to engage with certain apps and other teachers that aren't going to want to use those particular apps they want to use their own right. apps and so right. I can see that I mean, these devices have plenty of storage to put all mm -hmm. these pieces of software on there but how are we going to accurately track where the cost is actually coming and going to. Well, That's one right. way mm -hmm. we're doing it presently now is that we won't allow an app to be put on until a teacher or therapist or anybody come brings it to our office a form. Right. And Meg and I, right. yeah, Meg and I put together with the help of Vinny, and we look at it and we say, okay, this we can, yeah, I can see why this student would need that. So we're keeping track. Then we are responsible to install it as far right. as right, the license, you know the licensing right. because um, and uh, you know actually moving forward to to Kathy's point where it's all grant driven and once it's not mm -hmm. um, one of the things also that uh, Vinny now has a laptop and one of the consultants yeah. has talked to us about management software so mm -hmm. everything can be on this one laptop right. managing all the iPads throughout the district and I'm sure there's got to be a portion about it that can manage mm -hmm. the, right. the money part. Yeah, that was actually and, be my, my next yeah. comment. Yeah. We're going to have yeah. these yeah. consultants. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think if we could just reach out and see if we can mm -hmm. try and get a process that yeah. could yeah. be district-wide for managing those. The three of Especially us for if we're paying them, we might as well find yeah. out as much information as we possibly can. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Is, as these schools, as PTOs wish to purchase, uh, you mentioned the Memorial School, for example, and getting the PTOs to understand mm -hmm. that this is a purchase that's now not just for that school, but it's for okay. the district because mm -hmm. Uh, if these iPads are, are broken or need to be replaced, well, now we're not going to burden the school PTO to now replace yeah. them. Mm -hmm. So they really become district property. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of pieces that are learning curve for us right. that we're going to have sure. to figure out as we go. Yeah. But I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I'm glad we have you guys watching that. Vinny is our instructional technology paraprofessional. <laughs> it's in the right house that he's mm -hmm. watching over that with yeah. you guys. I, 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 I'm very and the light, we It'll found out something big. Like they're I individually licensed these apps. So right. we might need four Social Express apps, right. but that's four separate licenses mm -hmm. that we have. So it, it becomes costly. Right. Yeah. She explained to us, again, the consultant, that if you get audited, you yeah. need to supply right. all your licenses. Right. So right. don't start copying right. them. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's now so iCloud. You know, right. we, we said, can iCloud put it over there? It's not no. worth it. Right. <laughs> but it is a learning curve. Yeah. But again, the management, I think that's something going forward. We can definitely look into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be great. Well, what I can't imagine is doling this out to a thousand plus kids in a school district. Mm -hmm. and they think about the conversation we're having with a hundred. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now I manage that with a thousand, and now put them in the hands of students who take mm -hmm. them home with them and download apps. And I don't know how districts are honestly doing that and managing that right. well. Right. Yeah. There's, a, there's a product called Okta, which enables you to put all of your approved apps behind a secure firewall mm -hmm. with access. So you have an access code, an individual access code. So it allows you to manage not only the apps that are in there for that person as they log in, but if they ever left, you can manage the people, right? So, you know, somebody mm -hmm. leaves or whatever, you can easily change their code. So, you know, if they're at home trying to access it, they can't mm -hmm. access those apps either. So. Uh, we're looking at that where I work, and and uh, and uh, uh, when I find out more, I'll certainly oh, that's pass yeah, sure. it on to you. Yeah. But it's a it's a app management system in a secure setting that's all encrypted with single sign-on. So when you log in, you have access to all the apps that you've been approved for. So yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. definitely. Kathy, not not to make more work for you, but I think you should probably get in on this consultation conversation. Maybe get us a report on how. Absolutely. The best practices on that. And I think Vinny has already got a great handle yes. from um, the point that Meg made with the, we have the one sole laptop that mm -hmm. will control all right. of yeah. those, and that's the beginning stages. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made that purchase a couple months ago, yeah. so we're right. moving in that direction. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. so, so the middle school? The middle school. Well, the Life Rolls, pro Life Rolls program isn't a new program, but it was new this year in that um, Meg and I started it up again because of the need, the cohort group. And uh, we are so proud of it. It is now s at Middle School East, run by a very energetic, enthusiastic teacher, Alexis Correa. And the beauty of this program this year is that they started a cafe. So like our Prevoke up here, we, they are now um, cooking lunch and serving, bre uh, serving coffee. And um, Nancy, Angelini, and Connie have been great supports. Yeah. And my my wife actually like had lunch there today. Yeah. Did she? Yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. Some, some chicken, yeah. some sort of chicken concoction. Yeah. She said it was wonderful. It's great. It was great. So a lot of, lot, lot of crock pot <laughs> meals. <Yeah. laughs> and what's nice, they work in conjunction with the Prevoke up here. So the, these students go out in the bus to go shopping. They put together at the Life Skills their, their shopping list. They give it up over. They're learning budgeting. We have wonderful greeters. You know, Bob, Meg, and I went for lunch one day, and you know they're pushing the sandwich on us, and we just wanted soup. You know, we had right? to buy on credit. We didn't have any cash. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. Ben Rizzoli chased me down for about yeah. Yeah. two I weeks. Yeah. He did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, okay. The next important piece in middle school and high school, it goes together, is called transition planning, and transition planning is a law. That, uh, well, the law requires us to start transition planning to, to be discussed at every IEP, and an IEP, for Scott's sake, is an individual education plan. I never call it that, but <laughs> that's what it is. And um, it starts with, um, there's three components to transition planning, and that is when a student turns 14, we encourage them to attend their meetings and to talk about their, their vision, where they see themselves and with the help of their families, and then to develop goals around their vision as well as their, their disability and their needs. So, and then the third part of that transition plan is the action plan. What is the school system going to do to um, enhance their education, employment opportunities, and community? So um, the state has really, um, is coming down on us pretty hard now, and we're going to a conference, in fact, when is it, April 24th, um, to talk about um, the, how you know, important transition is for our students. Um, and then we received a letter this week that we will be required from the state, uh, it's called Indicator 13, because Milford is in cohort two, mm -hmm. um, and through Indicator 13, we will be looking at all transition plans that were written from um, I believe it was October of this year through April, and we'll be randomly selecting and, and going through and making sure that the right pr uh, planning is being done for our students. Right. And then we'll have to report that back to the state by July of this year. And la uh, just like Meg talked about the early childhood um, grant for assessment, which is called, which it's a title called the Brigants. Last year, um, Jen and I looked at a, um, assessment tool, which is called the Brigand's Transition Assessment Tool. So we have this tool for coming in students and the tool for going out, and that tool helps us look at, you know, how to deal with functional academics and how to help them with their daily living skills. So we're um, always assessing. So I don't think we're going to do bad on our audit. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, another part is that's been important to the middle school, unfortunately, is um, the mental health problems that we have. Um, I know yesterday um, Bob, Meg, and I attended a great conference. Um, Where Mike McIntyre spoke. I don't know yeah. if you've heard about that at the Juvenile mm -hmm. Advocacy Group. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, one of our concerns overall for the whole district, uh, the mental health, starting even with our young children. We're seeing kids that have anxiety, um, school phobias. Um, we're seeing kids, when once they get to the middle school, we're seeing uh, drug activity. Um, we're seeing other, other instances of mental health deficiencies that we really feel like we need to get some more help for our adjustment counselors, our guidance counselors, our school psychologists. They've all talked to us. They've, they've expressed this concern since, you know, since we've been in our jobs. And so what we did um, in talking about it is how do we get them this help? How do we how do we have someone come in and help um, help them help our students? Mm -hmm. um, so we we had a terrific gentleman, Dr. Noel, come in on March 20th. 
Um, he spoke to our school adjustment counselors and our school psychologists. Um, it was just very riveting, and you know, unfortunately, um, <coughs> the data shows the need to have to not close a blind eye that this is one area of um, a way to qualify for special ed, and it's becoming a big part. You know, so um, we're dealing with it every day. All right. Um, so, is there any project search in the high school? Okay. Well. In June, we plan on having all our students in Project Search come speak to you if we are welcome and let them share their experiences because it has just been a great <coughs> collabor collaboration between us and the uh, Milford Hospital. And these, all our students so far, ex yeah, we've had almost 100% success rate of placing them in jobs after they've completed their year at Project Search at the hospital. That's great. Yeah, great so program. we're really happy. And, and they're always welcome. Yes, okay, <laughs> well they are. They're coming into, because that's when uh, I would be very proud, Meg and I would be proud to hand them there. Some of them are receiving a diploma, some of them get a certificate of attainment, and I think that would be a nice ceremony for them to mm -hmm. be here and in front of all of you. I think so. that's a fantastic idea. Okay. Just thank want to co comment on that to thank Meg and Deb for for seeing that overseeing that program with Jen Walsh as well, mm -hmm. and that program is really the model program that I'd like to replicate with other mm -hmm. kinds of industries in the mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. of getting students placed. It works so well, and you know uh, mm -hmm. Frank Sable will tell you if he was sitting in the room as did Ed mm -hmm. Kelly, uh, that these students go to work. Roy Green, who's the educator that's dedicated, and with the support of the school committee, the school department, uh, he's dedicated there every day providing this educational experience for the students in Project Search. Uh, we've we've been in several tours to see them mm -hmm. in action, working in the stock room, working in, in these. It's just exciting to see how how thrilled they are, mm -hmm. and then the job success rate mm -hmm. of them landing actual work in the field uh, mm -hmm. after they leave there is just tremendous work you've done to keep that program thriving, and it will become the exemplar program. It's the we, Milford has an exclusive right now. Anybody else who's in that program, um, they tuition into the into this. Oh. They pay us to be part of that program. Milford is the exclusive with Milford Hospital mm -hmm. uh, for this program, and it is the model program that I want to emulate elsewhere in other businesses in town over the next couple of years. So thanks for your hard work in that. Just a comment. I think it's important to thanks. talk about your leadership in that. It's great. I would yeah. love when they do come back to, you know, uh, as well as get their diploma, but also explain what the what Project Search is. And they so learn. have them mm -hmm. tell you about how they learned how to write a resume, mm -hmm. how to go to an interview, um, how to be a part of <coughs> a, a work environment, um, show up on time, this is what I need to do, these That's are right. the tasks involved, and and it's great to see. And what was nice, the, the last tour that we got um, with the students, they had to speak to us about what their job was, and that was great because they had to speak in front mm -hmm. of a group. There mm -hmm. were, you know, a group of us there and then other people coming to the open house to, to see if they were interested in the program. So. It's a great, it's a great program. Yeah, I, I've so far gotten a call from Bellingham and Hopkinton of interest to have students come in. So it's just such yeah. a tremendous program. Yeah, so we're really awesome. can't sing its praises. Yep. loud, uh, loud enough. And some mm -hmm. invaluable skills. Yes. yes. Oh yeah. When you, mm -hmm. if you That's ever have a chance, just send them through that program. <laughs> 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 they're, they're great. Uh, um, it, we don't like any more than seven because, well, right now there is seven departments that each student rotates through. Okay. But um, the Milford students always come first, and then any other students, if we have openings, can then so tuition it. Yeah. This is our only our second year. Yeah. Okay, second so that's year. how much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, happened on March 6th, I don't know if any oh. of you had heard about it. Um, hopefully you did from your kids at home. Um, Jen Walsh uh, came to us about Spread the Word to End the Word and put together a school-wide assembly for the high school and also for Middle School East where we had students speak um, to the other kids in the school. Um, it was amazing in the auditorium. They filtered in every 20 minutes at a time and the kids got up. Uh, Brett Crosby spoke about living with a disability Cara, Cara Gregorio spoke about um, being a volunteer and being a best buddy and what it means to help someone with a disability. Um, the other children, our students, teenagers, um, that were part of the program, um, 
they had different statements on posters. Uh, we actually have the video that we were hoping to put online. Um, Jim Miller recorded it for us, so we're going to get it up. I'll have to actually send it out so you guys can um, take a look at it. It was an awesome program. Great. Yeah. Carrie Benock and Mike Tempesta both came up at the end and said they have been to many assemblies and there was, you can hear a pin drop. It was just, everybody was just so well behaved and so into the whole topic of um, not being discriminatory against anybody. Yeah. And a lot of the feedback that I heard from students was that the message was very powerful. Yeah. And it was very clearly conveyed mm -hmm. and that they took a lot away from it. Yeah. And it's the type of conversations that we need to have mm -hmm. that we should be having because it helps Right. It helps students understand the right way to deal with their classmates. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I know that um, Jen quickly said it, but I do want to say how proud I am, number one, of Jen, because she nominated both Brett and Kara to represent the state of Massachusetts at the National Youth Activation Leadership Conference that's going to take place. So and they were chosen. They were chosen. So, so Milford's going, on the map. Yeah, so that's they're going to be Again. representing us. Yeah. Which is great. Um, so one last initiative that will happen next fall, um, we uh, went to, actually it was uh, Judy Dagnes, Bob and myself went to Nipmuc, and we heard Chris Heron speak. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. remembers Chris Heron when he was a uh, basketball player at Durfee High School, I believe, in Massachusetts, and then he had received a full scholarship to Boston College. and. Um, Basically what happened to Chris is he got involved with drugs and alcohol and his life um, went through many different struggles. Uh, he's a recovering addict at this point. He actually had played for the Celtics um, and he obviously lo lost his um, spot on the team um, due to his struggles with drugs and alcohol and it was a very powerful s um, speech. I don't know if you've ever heard him speak. Go on YouTube if you haven't heard him just to see. So we reached out to the Heron Project and they're going to come, Chris is going to come here in September and speak to the whole high school. Um, so we're working on that. Um, <coughs> for that will probably be I believe September and I worked with Carrie Banach on a date to secure that the kids here. So that's something we're looking forward to. I think it's a very powerful and moving um, presentation, at least I felt it was, oh, yeah. and there wasn't a sound in Nipmuc High, <laughs> Nipmuc High School when, when he was speaking, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, the, the last few things that I had sent out basically had to do with the numbers in special education and how it broke down. Last year I had shared with you um, something similar. Our numbers are pretty much stable. They're pretty much very similar to last year. Um, so if you're looking at um, the disabilities across the district, you see the most in the area of communication followed by specific learning, autism, and then it goes through um, the rest of the uh, disabilities that you can be eligible through uh, for special education. Um, one of the things that we looked at this year when we were looking across the district is that we noticed that at Shining Star, you always know that that number is always going to be 51% regular education, 49% special education. And that's just the way mm -hmm. the funding goes. Um, so that number stays um, pretty relevant. But the rest of it, the state average is about 16 to 17%. We find that all the schools were about 14%. Yep. So that's great news. Woodland, we saw a spike. Woodland's at about 21, 22% right now. So that's something that we're looking at to see that if, in fact, is that because around third and fourth grade there's more evaluations, mm -hmm. like Deb and I were discussing earlier, there's a good possibility that that's the age that you really kind of hone in on those specific mm -hmm. learning disabilities, or is there something else that we need to help the school with? But right now, um, Woodland School is at about 21%, and everybody else is around the state average. Mm -hmm. Mega, I'd be interested in knowing um, what, how many one-to-one -one aids we need mm -hmm. as, as a district, and if that number has been relatively stable or if that's been growing or falling. Or, and I don't expect you to have it now. Right. But I have a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's grown. <laughs> it's grown. Um, primarily because of our milestones program and the need that has grown with that program. So we're looking at next year at the preschool for two full classrooms. Brookside will have two full cl classrooms for milestones. So that program has definitely grown. So I know our one-to-ones have grown um, just due to that fact alone. Um, but I definitely can get you further information. We have uh, about 100, 
110 Kathy, mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. um, assistance throughout the district in various capacities, um, but specific ones to one to one number I don't have off the top of my head, but it's definitely grown. Yeah. Just want to ask Megan if you go back to that wheel slide, the uh, the 715 students and mm -hmm. you broke it down. I, I know you're going to make this available on our website. You know the, <coughs> the presentation tonight. Could you just explain for the benefit of the committee and people who might be looking at this later who aren't in the industry, maybe what some of these things mean, like for example, specific learning or communication mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. intellectual, just to give people a rough idea of what might what might those disabilities look like if they didn't know that already. Would, that be, would you mind, it'd be okay just to come yeah, and explain that? <coughs> sure, sure, definitely. Just some uh, examples of what that would be. Right, about. so when you talk about specific learning disabilities, you're looking at a child with possibly dyslexia, it could be a reading disability, it could be a math disability, um, it could be um, something that's called a nonverbal learning disability. So there's a number of different factors that go into th that particular um, eligibility requirement. Um, we know that children under the communication umbrella, I can have Deb as a former speech and language therapist speak to that. Um, communication falls where they have problems with their receptive language, what they understand, their expressive language, what they spit out, uh, articulation, pragmatics, that's where communication would fall. Um, and to, to go along, some of them, like a specific learning disability, you would, you know, usually those students are not that far behind academically, and we try to truly keep them up with their curriculum. Um, the area that um, is the most probably... Um, For us is communication. Communication, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then when you look at multiple disabilities, we have students that have more than one disability. For example, in our Rainbow Room, which is at Brookside School, the children in that classroom are deafblind. Mm -hmm. So they have multiple um, areas of weakness. They could also have developmental delay. Mm -hmm. um, then when you talk about intellectual, so uh, a child with an intellectual disability is when you, you look at their cognitive level, and a lot of times our school psychologists are the ones to really um, pinpoint that for us, and <coughs> also outside evaluators, possibly through their own um, specialists that the family might take the child to, or the pediatrician has sent them to, a neuropsychologist, and that's where that disability falls. Um, health would be um, things like ADHD, falls mm -hmm. under health. Um, emotional disabilities can be anything from anxiety to emotional disturbance, op oppositional defiance, bipolar. Um, bipolar. Um, um, let's see. Hey, I uh, did I cover them all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that it, it is a disease. It's mm -hmm. a disease, Absolutely. just like heart disease, just mm -hmm. like liver disease. And I can remember one night having a conversation. He said, you could walk into my office and you could be yellow. And I said, you have yellow disease. And I gave you a pill and you got to take it mm -hmm. for the rest of your life and you'll be fine. You'd kiss me and walk out and you'd take that pill forever. But he said, with mental illness, he said, unfortunately, what happens is the old, when you're a kid, seeing, you know, you take this for 14 days, you'll be better. As you start to feel better, the first thing that an adult starts to do is say, well, when, when will I start coming off of this medication, or when do I cut down on this medication? And it's very difficult to treat. It must be very, very difficult to treat in children because, first of all, they don't know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be stigmatized. You know, so could, like, how do you handle that? It, 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 I mean, I look at the levels and, all, you know, what grade they're in, and I'm saying, wow. We are totally blessed to have great uh, adjustment counselors, both in and out of district, that I deal with. Um, mm -hmm as well as um, school psychologists <coughs> and all the community supports through Riverside, Wayside. Yeah. They Viewing. work, Viewing, they work with us to, um, because it, it, it's ongoing. You know, it, they don't have the, the, um, the problem in school. It's all, all the time. Exactly. So, it, you know, we're lucky to work in collaboration with everybody, but it is difficult. Yeah, and we have you know, we Amy, get calls left and right about problems. Yeah, we Amy Leone is very active at the youth center, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and to sit and talk to her sometimes, mm -hmm. you just say, wow, mm -hmm. it's got to be very, very difficult to handle on a child. Mm -hmm. It is, and a lot of times, if a student goes into crisis in our school, every school has a crisis team, mm -hmm. um, and they mobilize, you know, mm -hmm. immediately when that call comes, and they're there for our kids. 
and you know and if we need to we bring the school resource officers in and they bring Re Riverside right with there mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. and they act as soon as they can mm -hmm. um, to help the student to go to the next step if they need to go to the emergency room or maybe they need to go for an evaluation at Riverside maybe they um, you know the parent needs to come in and meet and, and talk about what next step might there need to be have our psychologist talk to the to the pediatrician talk to the outside physician sometimes they're ho the kids are hospitalized um, so they could be in any one of the the treatment facilities across the state and so then they get discharged then they come back to the school and and what kind of plan do we have for them when they come back to the school right. so mm -hmm. it is a very complicated process in the children that um, struggle with this on a daily basis it's it's a very hard thing to see and they uh, are younger than you would think right. I mean they yeah. start mm -hmm. real young mm -hmm. it is something and then you have the issue of dealing with the parents afterwards because it's that's an, a whole other yeah. heartbreak heartbreak so yep. along those same lines as we think about um, you'd mentioned with uh, talking about some of the specific learning disabilities mm -hmm. you're saying you know some of those kids are you know not that far behind mm -hmm. um, can you kind of qualify that a little bit I know just from an experience perspective, not that far behind for from well, a special they, education professional, maybe well, different than what a parent sees. So when they see my, my students mm -hmm. a year behind, mm -hmm. they hit the panic button. Right. So just to speak Absolutely. to that a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. you know, it really depends on the student. Mm -hmm. So it really, and it really depends on the progress that they're making. But y you're right, for us, we see the gamut. Mm -hmm. So for a parent, <laughs> I know with my own too, when they right. come home and I see the one, two, three, four, or five now, I'm wondering mm -hmm. what's the four? Is mm -hmm. Should he be a five? Right. You know, you go through that whole mm -hmm. process as a parent. Um, but with a specific learning disability, when you sit down and, and they have those types of evaluations and you see that it's a year behind, mm -hmm. um, you really grow, grow very concerned if you see if it's more than that, mm -hmm. in my opinion. When I see a child being evaluated and they're two years behind, well, what kind of interventions have been put in place prior to that point and, and what didn't work and mm -hmm. what needs to be put in place to bring them further along than they already are? Right. Um, so you're right, it is, it is a difficult, and it's relative to who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, um, I get the, phone the calls other from parents about that, mm -hmm. and they but say, the oh, well, not that far behind. My, ch my child's a year behind, I and they kind of hit the panic button. Right. So it's good to kind of hear. Right. Well, no one even wants to hear a week right. behind. Yeah, no, week no. no. <laughs> one wants to hear. They, they, should, they missed yesterday. Right. They don't want to hear that either. Right. But, but with right. the beauty of inclusion, those kind of students can succeed very well mm -hmm. because they'll have the support of the regular ed teacher in the room plus the special ed support to help, you know, with mm -hmm. some of the accommodations that will enable him or her to be exactly where his peer is. So that's probably what I meant. It's like kind of, it's, it's something that's tangible and unlike you know sometimes our emotional kids that mm -hmm. they can be you know have a very high IQ but then have these issues that you say they're just not working up to their potential and it's so hard to get them to. So. Thank you. Um, the, the one other one I didn't touch upon was developmental delay mm -hmm. and you see that in our preschool children up till age nine. So after age nine the, t the children are typically reevaluated in that specific designation will will change so you'll see it move into another area mm -hmm. um, so that's what the, the breakdown is I think I touched upon most of them mm -hmm. okay um, and then the last thing was basically the student breakdown by placement so last year I talked about the four different types of placements and we still have the, the four different types of placements and we are still holding our own we're around the same as far as inclusion which would be when a student is in the regular education classroom for over 60 percent of the time partial inclusion um, if you follow the 60 percent they would be out um, more than that um, so they are um, partial inclusion then sub separate is where the majority of the day is in a separate classroom within the, the building with inclusion opportunities and then lastly is out of district and currently right now we have about 63 students that are out of district <coughs> that Deb oversees any questions, questions? Do you remember, Meg, when I was running for election was when we were trans, we were bringing milestones mm -hmm. yeah. back mm -hmm. and doing away with, what was it, New England Center for Children? Yeah. 
and there were many, I, Christine and Paul were on the board at the time, and there were many, many meetings with parents that were very, very concerned, and rightfully so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, you know, the, the message always was just give us time, mm -hmm. just give us time. And I can honestly say today that I, yeah. I run into some of those parents, and uh, they're just absolutely thrilled. Mm -hmm. They couldn't be happier that their oh, child nice is, is back in district and, mm -hmm. and with, their, with their peers, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's what everybody kept saying. Wouldn't you rather have mm -hmm. your child mm -hmm. back here with their friends? And so right. it worked. And just, you know, thank you so much for your they, hard work. They are doing a great job. Yeah, yeah. it's a great really. program. And tell everybody, please. Yeah. It's a great program. Uh, I just want to say, too, I mean, you, I was enlightened with this, too, and I you realize that there's, you know, there's no greater challenge, I guess, facing public schools with the increase of individuals that, are, that need special ed programs now. And... Um, I can see, you know, right now, I mean, your staff, uh, you, you said that you had an adjustment council that was a total blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the two of you ladies are a total blessing in, in your staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, you go above and beyond to rescue a child from a lifetime of a disability. And that's awesome, I think. That's quite am amazing on what you could do. Um, it's definitely equity in education, which is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not only the law, but it also would strengthen our com community as well. And, and I just say, you know, again, I'm very impressed on what you do. And we all now had a chance to see behind that mm -hmm. proverbial curtain of special ed. Mm -hmm. And the work you do, you have like, what's uh, 63 out of district. And, and that's from hard work from, from Meg and Deb and, and, and the rest of their staff to keep that low. And mm -hmm. the people have to understand it, you know, that it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings that is, is caused by, by that, and, 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 it's, and it's amazing. Again, thank you so much, and I, we're, the, we're the ones that, that are blessed. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. thanks. We'll be back in June. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be watching. <laughs> 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 The superintendent of schools, we actually have two um, items here. We have a quick budget update, and then we also have a quick Woodland Building Project update. Bob? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the committee will recall we had a meeting with the um, the Finance Committee uh, a few, I don't know, how many weeks back that was. Two weeks now. ago. A couple of weeks ago, we had asked, given our first pass at a budget, a roughly 4% increase over last year's budget, uh, parceling out some of those costs related to special education out of district. Some of those were beyond us. Uh, a question about ELL programming, uh, some of those the state unfunded mandates, and uh, looking at some of that. Uh, the, the Finance Committee asked for more detail about what the impact would be, the additional 2%, understanding that the 4%, 2% was, uh, was understood to be special education and ELL, English language learners. Um, but the difference of how to get the other 2%, what would the impact be if the Finance Committee weren't to, you know, to approve that funding? Uh, so we're at a point where we're going to come back to them. We had agreed the meeting was very cordial. Um, it, it, to come back, originally it was going to be the week after April school vacation week to give some updates when I have some better enrollment numbers. One on the high school programs, that the, the high school enrollment will happen, that numbers will be finalized uh, over school vacation week. And then kindergarten registration, because of a snow day, we have uh, the final day of kindergarten registration uh, next Tuesday uh, and to process those numbers of enrollment. And the reason why I bring that up is because if we have to make reductions, perhaps if we have a low enrollment, say in kindergarten, maybe able to shift around through attrition and not have to replace somebody here and there, perhaps that could bring down that, that this two, two additional percentage points that we need to bring down. Uh, but it's not known yet. So the problem we're up against is the Finance Committee uh, has asked to move their meeting because of some scheduling conflicts up a week or ahead a week uh, during school vacation week. So we have that Wednesday at 7 o'clock during school vacation week is the next meeting with the Finance Committee to talk about that. So really the discussion for tonight is to say, uh, Everything you heard tonight, all the success stories that we've worked hard to, to this year uh, with the advanced placement at the high school, to our special education programming, to all the great things that we do here, the impact is going to be personnel. It's just that simple. Uh, and it's not easy, and it's not something that I'm going to support. I'm going to go down fighting on this one. Um, but I'll try to make it for the committee to have the best informed decision as to which personnel makes sense if we have to go that route. Um, but again, we, we have an obligation to provide the best education we can for our kids. And um, I'm not sure we can do that if we don't have the funding that we need from the Finance Committee, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but again, I will look at that. It's, it's still early for us right now to say what those cuts might be. And I don't want to put that out there, speculation that, that can be damaging to people. Um, 
and I don't want to do that. But I want to get, if, you know, ensure the committee that we're watching that. Kathy and I have talked about this at length. We'll continue to watch the high school enrollment uh, for program of studies for course subscriptions to see if there's some, some opportunities there as well as enrollment for our, for our um, uh, for school. I will say I'm concerned about enrollment in Milford. Uh, perhaps we've designed such a great program. People are coming. We had 11 registrations the other day. I don't mean kindergarten registrations for next year. I mean 11 kids registering to come to Milford this year in April for this school year. 11. That's concerning because I'm not even sure where they're moving to. These are, you know, and these are coming with legitimate addresses, residency cards in hand, mostly re um, uh, rental property in town, although some new, you know, purchased houses. And I'm, I'm concerned about the, the number of families coming in and what that will mean for class size, particularly if we look to not replace a teacher or to have class sizes of 28 and 30. Uh, I'm not willing to go there either. So it'll be an ongoing discussion for us, and I just want to the committee to be fully informed that we're watching this closely do the best we can to have an informed discussion with the Finance Committee meeting, although it is a little bit ahead of time when we'll actually have the numbers in. So I don't know how much you want to engage in the discussion tonight, but I'm not really prepared to tell you about what specific cuts I would put on the table because I'm just not there yet. Cool. Bob, I was going to ask, uh, with that in mind, that deficit in mind, <laughs> do we have any idea what the Chapter 70 funds are going to be for this year? Well, we do. The, we have we don't have the second house approval, right? We have the yeah. governor's next week. We have the governor's number, and we have uh, you know one of the houses numbers. Um, it won't probably won't be as good as the governor's proposal, is my guess. The the danger with the chapter seventy question, though, is that up until it happens to be that the increase uh, is like you know two million dollars more than it's been in past years, or any round numbers, rough numbers. The, the, the downside to making that claim, though, is that for so many years before, when we weren't getting an fair appropriation, we never made that argument. All of a sudden, now to make the argument to say, hey, we're entitled to those seven, Chapter 70 dollars, uh, it wouldn't be fair for us to now make that claim. I don't, I don't think. Uh, right. You know what I mean? Like to say, all of a sudden, the numbers are up, therefore we should get it. Because when the numbers were down, the town was generous, generous enough to realize the need for our kids and provide it. So I, I believe that we can make this work with the Finance Committee. I think the Finance Committee just wants to be fully informed of the impact. Okay. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and in my experience in, in, as superintendent over the last six years in Milford, is, uh, in now seven budget cycles, has been that the, when we work together, as we have so well, that we do the right thing for our community. And they just want to know how the money is being spent. And that's, and that's fair. Taxpayers want to know what the impact's going to be. And we don't want to see our programs diminish. It brings down property value. It brings down all those things that you don't want to have happen. Uh, to a town that we're doing so well, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure we're doing it as, as efficiently as possible. That's the goal to, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the best price to get the job done. I don't, I don't know if I've yeah. answered the question about the yeah, Chapter no, 70 no, piece, no, but yeah, we, don't, we don't know yet. You know, about another week much. before we know right. how that will really settle Because out. usually the past, in the past, the years that I've, I've been on, you know, when we came up with our you know, total budget and, and what we were going to present to town meeting, lo and behold, sometimes that Chapter 70 money saved us because we got a little more than, than what we thought. That's right. And, and, and the town may look at it that way, saying, yeah, mm -hmm. this number is up, and therefore the increase, but mm -hmm. we can weather that storm, perhaps. Sure. One thing that uh, uh, both the House and the Senate uh, on Beacon Hill actually came back and said was, for the last several years, the trend has been they do one budget, and then they come back and do a second pass at it. Mm -hmm. They did say, uh, I want to say it was probably right around the same time we did the Finance Committee meeting, they said, we're doing one budget this year, guys. They're, don't look for another one in September, an amendment. Um, that's what they're saying. So <laughs> we'll see what actually ends up happening with it, but because but that's what they're saying. You know, remember we, we oh, yeah. Like $400,000 right. that was given right. extra for edu education. Right? That's right. Yeah. You know, so that would have really bailed us out. But, yeah. Can I, I just say one thing, too, about the budget that I think um, can happen is the impact it is huge, and we have to show that really well. Mm -hmm. but we have to show it... Um, more than a year at a point in time. We have to show it going forward um, so that this is the impact today. If, if we have to do this, this is the impact today, but guess what? Next year, these, this is what's going to happen, and the impact will be this. Because it's, it, it's a growing, our, our, our schools grow, everything grows. And right. to just look at it like this little snapshot in time, it's great. We can argue the impact today, but there's, there's impact down the road. So even if we get to this place today, well, next year we still have this growth, and we have to get there. And I think we, we to show our full impact, we need to do a a, a more of a long-term plan that we don't often present. I mean, we know, but let's. That's a great point. I, I think it's really important because when I've gone to these FinCom meetings, that's what I hear: is that okay? Well, you were here last year, and you said the same thing, and we worked together, and we got here. Well, okay, we're here last year. We're here this year. 
next year we're telling you this is where we're going and that kind of perspective just like we do with our long-term planning our capital plans we, we need to do better I think in the budget process that's a great point Christine and the, the other item to update uh, the committee on this evening is the Woodland School building project um, I feel like we're doing that every day so I don't even know where you <laughs> left off uh, but I can tell you I'll just start with today uh, at your seats I distributed um, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it. it was, today was called the Woodland Elementary School kickoff meeting. Uh, this, this just happened today, so I didn't have a chance to get into your packets ahead of tonight. Uh, and I provided you, uh, although you don't have the agenda, I apologize. You have just the, uh, the timeline. So on the first page, everything that's grayed out will show you this is what's been done since January of 2013. Uh, and then the page behind that is um, items to be done with this Woodland School project. But just to, to boil it down for you where we are today, we had a meeting uh, in Boston today with our with our team, an excellent <laughs> team. In fact, I happen to be reading, uh, separate from the school building project, I happen to be reading, you know, the, my, my downtime, School Planning and Management magazine. <laughs> Fascinating <laughs> reading. There's a whole magazine so, on that? Yeah, it's, it's, actually a man, it's a national publication, so I'm flipping through, uh, you know, just some downtime, and I happen to flip through and I see this article that's um, in here written <laughs> by our architect. So uh, HMFH Architects, Laura Warnick, right here, roadblocks to a quality education using school design to support teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And part of the major reasons we went with HMFH was because of their ability to have educational planning in-house. So you don't have to sub that kind of work out. It's really committed. And uh, it was just really exciting to see a national publication just came out this month to see the architect that we selected happens to be a feature story in school planning and management. You know, it didn't even, Laura didn't even tell me about that. I told her about that today when I met with her. Um, so we have a great team. Our owner's project manager, Jocelyn Lesser and Associates, are fantastic. Uh, they've not let us down at all. They've held their word. They've been at every single meeting, all of them, the whole team. They've been farming out to some, to some people on their team. Their architects came. There was two architects sitting today. Um, it was just a fantastic uh, team to work with. So we were in Boston today for the purpose of, of um, going forward now with the kickoff meeting. We have our project manager in place. We have our designer in place. Uh, all the subgroups, all the subcontractors uh, will be in place to do now the feasibility study work, which will happen over the um, uh, over the next uh, well year or so, really, because we we will have the the determination actually comes in, into if I can walk you through this yeah, just a I little bit in July. We, I think what people actually care about is the schematic design. Yeah, the schematic when design. Schedules. this is like what I want to know. When are we going to see it? On or about school? Yeah, October third. Like, on or about October third. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. On or about a third October third. We'll <laughs> see what. We're going to put forth. There's a lot of steps to go along the way. The oh, I made some I notes. Totally appreciate um, it, but it's just like the kid at the candy store. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. tell right. me. When's Christmas? When's Christmas? Right. Like I just so want to know. As part of this, we'll obviously look at uh, as you know probably from, from your dad's <laughs> on the school building committee on the, yeah. on the educational visioning task force. So he's very involved. Uh, Craig, as is, is Craig and Sigley and our team, we've been meeting with uh, with teachers, um, talking with some teachers, talking with some directors about the educational vision. What's great to hear from MSBA and from our and from our uh, support, the OPM is that everything that's going to happen with a, with a new woodland or a renovated woodland, whatever it's going to be, is driven by the educational plan. That educational program, even the MSBA restated today, that is the driver. Anything you want to build from that comes from the program. We're not going to put the programs to fit the school. And that's really important, particularly since we're, we're looking at one of the largest elementary schools in the Commonwealth uh, with a 985 design enrollment. Now, um, there's there's been numbers that I've seen with NESDEC reporting that have come out that have caused some concern because the Milford, over the last uh, 10 years at least, has had a relatively flat enrollment. Despite this 11 kids I mentioned this week, over a 10-year period of time, it's shifted only by 100 in 10 years in Milford schools. So you have the same graduating classes roughly every year. Um, it, it seems to be an increase, a bubble increase coming up, according to the NESDEC, the National Educational School Development Council projections, uh, which have put that number somewhere above 1,000 um, for Woodland School versus the 985 enrollment. Uh, but the school is, the, I, I shared that with the MSBA today, saying well, we have a certified design enrollment of 985, but the numbers I'm seeing are different than that. Yeah. I don't want to go out to the beginning of this job, put a building, a school building in place that's already too small on day one. Yeah. But they margin for that. They, they really, they, they're very careful not to build schools that are too big. But they do have that, 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 that elasticity, if you will, that allows for those, those years of, because as you look out 10 years from <laughs> you know, the NESDEC projections, projections, those numbers actually do come back down to that nine, hundred number. So there is that wiggle room, if you will, uh, in their design enrollment. Even though it's a 985, don't be alarmed if on the first day of school there's 1,100 kids. It's designed to accommodate that, 
um, that, but it has to have a, it's formulaic based on birth rate data to the extent that that's accurate. You, so you understand, of course, that we Please don't can't put it, we can't have this building and have Please. exactly have, have uh, oh, no, coats no. in the hallway and no, no, the no, no. we can't. We <laughs> uh, and that's why I'm putting that's why I'm putting it out there right up right up front because everything is predicated on the design enrollment and the architects and the school building authority. They're all they don't get in the business of building bu over building buildings because there's an expense to that. They build it for the based on a, a 10 year, 20 year projection, uh, history and projections. So just to want you to, the, 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 the takeaway from this is the MSBA is aware of that. This is not new to them. Hmm. They build schools all the time. Um, but I want to put that out there. Uh, but the, the day was very, uh, very, very productive to, uh, day today. So we'll go forward now con doing the more of the educational visioning uh, with this team going forward. Uh, and then they'll come up with the best possible scenario to present to the MSBA, as you'll see on here, and then ultimately uh, take this to, uh, to town meeting for, okay. for some decision to move forward. But it's very exciting. And just, well, it yeah. looks like October 3rd is when we get the design. But it looks like by probably around Thanksgiving, we'll have it kind of not just see what it looks like, but we'll actually, it looks like that's when the approval actually goes through. Yeah, so the town mm -hmm. meeting would be, uh, would be a standalone town meeting right. article, likely to be in January of 2014. Right. So before that happens, there's all these date, deadlines they have to back out of, which is what this, what this um, right. tells you here on the, it's a, it's a pretty involved checklist. I won't go through it line by line, um, but you'll be briefed again by our, by our project manager as to what all these means, so there'll be a chance for follow-up. I want to just give you the quick briefing as to this just happened today that we've had a kickoff meeting to go forward. I, I just wanted to add really quick, um, at the last meeting that um, Bob is referencing, the visionary meeting, where we were talking square footage, the project manager was there and the architect, so I thought it was perfect timing to mention, to consider the possibility of storage for the bays mm -hmm. if the land mm -hmm. would accommodate something even underneath and that we had a great need for that and unfortunately in an elementary project they would not consider it oh, so it, sort of bad news but i wanted to let you know that at least we did the outreach because it was a perfect plan that of mm -hmm. course would not work so is there any questions on that MSBA work, but I, I apologize if you don't think you've been out of a loop on that. I, I literally do this every single day, so I don't know where you left off. But is any, any ever any questions? Should be an email, or I'd be happy to update every meeting. I think it's a standing agenda item now. Yes, so we'll just keep it there. Mm -hmm. I think October third is Christine's oh, new right. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Coming in with jungle bells. See what you, what you want to buy. Yeah. All right, fair enough. And uh, that's all I have this okay. evening. Uh, so the next item <coughs> on our agenda is uh, the of the assistant superintendent approval warrants. Um, this evening I have um, a list of the latest appointments from our last meeting. No vote is required. It's for your information only. And I do have one warrant this evening for approval in the amount of $19,611.13. Motion from Rob, second from Paul. All in favor? Opposed and Mr. Favor. Motion carries. And we have, and we have gifts, we have two like gifts tonight. Uh, we have one gift from the Oliva family um, for technology in Ms. Shostead's class. Um, I want to thank them very much for, for that gift. And then we have a, uh, the Blair House uh, gave a donation um, for supplies um, in the amount of $200. So we want to thank the Blair House as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need a vote on this. Motion from Dawn, second from Christine to accept these two gifts from the Oliva family and from the Blair House of Milford. In favor, opposed, and in favor, the motion carries. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is our, our policy subcommittee updates. Do we have any updates tonight? We are meeting on Monday, uh, April 8th. We are scheduled for meeting, so we'll be reviewing uh, a couple of policies uh, uh, on that day. Okay. And the security subcommittee? And we had a meeting a week and a half ago, which was the first meeting after the drill that we sure. did. So there was a lot of thanks and ver very well received all around. Um, during that session, there were lots of ideas that came to the surface, you know, things like rubber stoppers for the doors and mm -hmm. those types of things. So Bob uh, was going to reach out to um, the fire chief to make sure that that's something that he wants to have in place. And, and then we were talking about adding those stickers, which Bob had mentioned uh, previously. And we also talked about taking kind of uh, the subcommittee out onto the road into the individual schools to assess the needs on a school-by-school -school basis, understand, uh, you know, what they feel 
and get their input. And that that was the big thing was the principals all came to you know came to the table saying they have had some amazing uh, input from from the teachers and and the employees at the school, and uh, everybody wants to participate in this. So uh, Bob was recommending we go out do kind of a, a building by building assessment and then bring those ideas to the table. Terrific. So the, uh, the next item on our agenda is new business. Does any member bring new business tonight? Does any member bring old business tonight? Uh, we do have an executive session this evening. Uh, the executive session is for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations with one of our unions. For the negotiation uh, discussion of those Negotiations uh, in public would compromise our position, so therefore we'll go into executive session. We do need a roll call uh, of every uh, member agreeing to enter executive session. Rob? Yes. 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 Uh, we will now go into executive session. Uh, we will not be returning. Thank you.